admit. Okay. Um, there's two of me. Sorry. Let's do that. Okay. Oops. Uh, okay. Let's go live. Uh, yeah. We we ready? Sure. <laughs> okay. Hi parents, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Petra Dito from Victim to Hero. Um, today, I wanted to welcome you guys to a very important event. It's our monthly event called Parental Alienation, the Aftermath. The reason we are doing this event is because um, for a lot of parents who are targeted parents who are victims of parental alienation, you have many questions in your mind about what's going on um, you know what's going through your children's mind and also what's going on behind the closed doors at the alienators home um you have many questions i'm sure about you know um what can you say and you know why you know i, I know there's million of questions now before i start going on and on please let me know you know where you're calling in from if you can hear us okay because i want to make sure that um the audio is okay that you can actually hear us um, we have the pleasure of having Jacob and Kim with us today. These are both adult children, victims of parental alienation, just like me. Um, hi, Claudia. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, please let us know where you're calling in from. Also, it's going to be really helpful if you let us know uh, who you are, as in, you know, are you the parent, are you the adult children, or are you a professional um, therapist or extended family, because that way it helps us understand what kind of topic we should cover in this conversation. Uh, please let us know your questions. We're going to try to pick up as many questions as possible. Uh, another aspect of why this type of event is so important is because and I apologize, I should be turning my phone off. Um, this is a big no, no. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, it's very important for us to have this type of, of conversation is because there's actually a huge group of deniers out there who actually claim that parental alienation is not real, that it's something that only being cooked up by fathers, abusive fathers, who just came up with this idea and then blame mothers on it. So I want to make sure that um, we have a balanced conversation and who could be better than talking about this than the adult children victims, because we, as the victims of this, we knew what happened to us. Nobody else knew what happened behind the closed doors. We can tell you what happened and we are not fighting for custody. We are not here to get even with our exes. We are not here to try to raise or lower the custody payment, child support payment. You know, this is none of that. What we wanted to do is to bring light to this, to bring public awareness to this issue, to point out that this is real and we don't want any more of this happen to more children in the next generations. So this is why we have to have this conversation. So thank you and welcome Kim and Jacob. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jen in the chat room and John, Donna, uh, Claudia, thank you so much. Uh, Thuton, Paul, Maria, thank you so much, you guys. Marlene, uh, Nithi, Susan, um, thank you so much. And please like this video, please share. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think there's some spam in the chat room. So if you guys see something that looks suspicious, do not click on those link. Uh, I apologize, we don't have anyone that watching the chat room to moderate that kind of things. I could see that. Um, but um, so if you guys see link, don't just click on it. Uh, we'll try to clean that up after. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, uh, Kim and Jacob. So um, before we start the conversation, let's talk about um, how old were you when this started? Kim, how old were you when this started? Um, 10. 10. 10 uh, years old, yeah. Yeah, and your parents um, started to get divorced at the time and they already divorced or they were still together? My parents divorced when I was two. I was actually um, abducted from my, my mother at 10 by okay. my father. So, okay, we'll, we'll dig in a little bit more, but that seemed to me like abduction is like the extreme end of parental alienation. That tell me that the stuff going on way before you were 10, uh, whether you remember or not, there, I'm sure there's indicators and activities that you may not have registered. Um, what about you, Jacob? How old were you when this started? 
Yeah, for myself, I had to go back in time to figure that out. I was 15. I guess my parents got divorced and kind of everything just came as a shock. Wasn't really aware that there was anything going on behind the scenes. Parents were really quiet about, uh, you know, their own issues. And the most I think we saw was, you know, mom would stay in bed a little bit later and uh, dad would just go to work. So, yeah, when uh, I believe we, we left October of 2004 from the home and uh, mom took us and all the kids away from dad that day and from then, it was just a little bit of a shock and learning experience to see what's actually going on between everybody. Yeah. Um, guys in the chat room, could you let me know if you guys could hear Kim and Jacob okay? Because uh, from me, it's a little Coming bit to be louder. louder. Okay. Um, no, let's just check. Um, so if you guys could let us know if you could hear us. Okay, Mary said louder, please. So um, yeah, if we could just like you both. I can turn up the gain on my please. microphone, no problem. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, or getting closer. Uh, a little bit because and you guys I assume in the chat room you guys could hear me okay right um okay Jane says she could hear okay um oh. okay so Jacob was 15 um and Kim was 10 when she noticed uh for me it started as young as I could remember I think I was a few years old uh, now so uh, the reason I asked for this is because um research have shown that there's a certain age range that would where children are more susceptible to this and it's usually like preteen and that's when it usually started so it kind of show here the same with both of you guys you you all at that sort of preteen age like the early teen kind of thing um so so kim this um you said you were taken away abducted from your mother yes my mother had custody yeah okay and then your father took you away from your mother my father and his wife yes they took us and moved us out of state Okay, so um, so in Kim's case, uh, the alienator is is a father, and the targeted parent is a mother. And in Jacob's case, what what is your situation? Um, it's more, I guess we, we grew up really homeschooled, so it's it's for me, I guess even growing up as an adult, it was hard for me to say even which was one or the other. But for the most part, it was definitely uh, my dad alienating uh, the kids against mom. Um, right up until I guess we've all become adults and kind of can kind of maybe see things as the way they are, maybe. Um, but yeah, that was the most of it. Okay, so yeah. thank you. so that's really interesting because we had uh, events in the past where um, the alienators were always the mothers and then the targeted parents was always father and we have had people that complaining and said, hey, you know, you need to be balanced. You need to show that this is, um, not just mothers or fathers issues and and that's exactly our stand is that it's not a gender issue at all. It can happen to fathers, it can happen to mothers and we see that every day we talk to so many targeted parents who you know who are mothers who are fathers, so it can can happen to both this, this is not a gender issue. Um, so the reason we are not screening is because. Uh, we wanted to bring in as many adult children as possible, and we had many events. So, you know, if it happens at one event, we have all the fathers in another event, we have all the mothers as a targeted parents. It just happened in that one isolated event, but we're doing many events. This is a monthly event, you guys. We come back every month. So uh, overall, it should give you a more balanced picture of what's going on. So, um, okay, so Kim, uh, can you tell us like, yeah, let, let's start with your story. What happened? So um, um, I know you had asked if I remember things before I was 10. And I don't I don't have much memory of my dad even being involved in our life. He actually, um, he and my mom divorced. And then he went and got remarried. And we spent some time with my father and his new wife. And then um, one Christmas, he decided, uh, actually back up a little bit. He moved with his new wife to another state. He moved to Colorado. And one Christmas, we understood from our mother that we, my siblings and I, that we were going to be spending the holidays with my father and his wife in Colorado. So they came, picked us up, took us to Colorado. And the day we were supposed to move back um, is the day they told us we would never be returning to our mother. So at that time, um, they also told that we would never be speaking to our mother again, that if we tried to, we would be punished. So um, there was no, we didn't know that, it, thinking back now in 1976, so I guess I'm older than, <laughs> but in 1976, we didn't know that 
in that moment, we wouldn't be reunited with our mother. I was reunited with her in 1982. So it was six years of no conversation, none at all. We were, um, we lived in a very toxic, um, very abusive uh, environment. Everything you can imagine happened in that environment. And we were told that we would be punished and we were threatened with our lives many, many times if we tried to reach out to our mother. And I remembered her phone number, her address. <laughs> Sorry. Take the time. No, we were too afraid and too brainwashed to call her or reach out. So that's that was the start of it all. So in your case, it was very blatant. There's no, nothing subtle about it. It was, you knew this was wrong. Oh my God, yes. It was. You knew it was wrong. There's no sort of like subtlety about it because this is the thing when it comes to alienation, there's a, a whole range of tactics that alienators use. Sometimes it's very subtle uh, and where the children don't notice. But in this case, you went on a supposedly a short trip, a vacation that you yeah. anticipated to go back to your mother. And then at the end of it, it was kind of ripped under the carpet, it was pulled under you and it was stolen from you. Actually, that's what Montana just said. Your child was completely stolen from you. Yes. Um, so you were kidnapped and you were being told clearly that you are not allowed to. So there's clear threats on on any of your behaviors, if you're trying to talk to her. And so, I mean, I can't even imagine as adults, you guys, you know, imagine you're planning to go somewhere and then suddenly you realize that you're not going back home again, even as adults, okay? And now as children, not only you're not going back to where you anticipate, you're not allowed to contact one of your parents, which is like a key foundation of your childhood, that's your security, your sense of identity and everything. She and was the only, she was the only parent that we knew she was our mom and we never lived with our father. She was the only parent I, I knew at that point. Yeah. yeah. So, and we lived in an environment that was, um, I'm still haunted with nightmares and there's so much that I've repressed that has happened during that time that I can't even I can't even put it to words. Like there's, and honestly, I thought everyone lived like that at that point because I was a kid. I thought that's, you know, everyone whose parents were divorced, I thought it was, you know, just that environment, so. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love to dig into that a little bit more in a bit. Um, and this is, this is a huge topic about a lot of um, people will argue, oh, you know, the alienator is, is taking the child away because the alienator loves the child so much. Well, no, the alienators don't actually care. The child is just a tool, just a weapon, just a thing. And the alienators completely violated your rights, have no care at all for who you are as a human being and just using you. And so a lot of the time the alienator steal the child, but don't really care about the child. And then they abuse, it's very common. The alienators are actually really abusive to the child. Right. themselves and this is my situation personally so i i and the same with what kim said is as children we grew up in that environment we had no idea that that's not okay then that that's abuse we just took it as this is how it's supposed to be um what about you jacob what what's going on yeah i guess so for us it was uh well we grew up in a really homeschooled uh, environment very sheltered very secluded from society as yes, outside influences uh mom and dad kind of came together and decided that was the the family they wanted to have um very grateful for my upbringing i guess you know things were happening behind the scenes we couldn't see or didn't know and uh yeah one morning uh what i got here for the date october 2004 uh i can't remember what day it was uh just know we woke up and mom said hey guys we're all leaving and uh you know, at that point we were pretty Christian. So it's like, well, whatever mom says goes. So, you know, I supported whatever she was going with, help pack up the kids. At that point we had myself, three younger brothers, three younger sisters. And uh, there was a police escort that showed up at the door. 
Uh, again, we were, I wasn't really scared of the police. They were more just like, you know, community people. It's where it's, you know, police are police. Okay, sure. Um, I remember them asking, does your dad have any guns? And they're like, sure. Yeah. They're upstairs. You know, they're locked in the closet kind of thing. Um, and then we all packed ourselves in the big 15 passenger van and drove South to, uh, uh, a little place, uh, South of where we lived at that time. Um, at that point, you know, we didn't really understand what was going on. We, I think what we were told was we were just going on a little trip. Um, I, I grew to understand later on in life that mom did believe that she was in danger and she was doing what was best for the kids. Um, to which I can just say, you know, mom, I'm sorry that, you know, you had to live through that. And we don't know what, what you went through, um, as kids, uh, we're just kind of in the middle. And, uh, uh, as, as we kind of left, um, you know, the, I can hear the, the brothers and sisters saying, you know, we got to tell dad, we can't just do this and, and do this, but you know, we, we don't really know what's going on. Um, and I think that is the beginning of, uh, the potential, uh, I guess, struggle that the kids now are involved with. And from that point on, that was where I guess the divorce kind of started playing out because uh, we had no idea what was going on. Um, before this day, however, there were some instances, and I hear you talking about that. I, I know you use the term loaded language, but that there was a lot of that in the house uh, coming from dad. Um, things like, you know, your mother's kind of like this right now, guys, we got to give her some space or, you know, there's some things that are about to happen, guys, just hang tight, like stuff's about to go down. And we didn't really know what that meant. And, and, and as an adult now, you know, that's, that's not for the kids. Like it's, you know, that's not for us. Um, you know, if you guys got some issues, you know, figure it out or, or get a counselor or something, but yeah, to have the kids be in the middle was really hard. Um, I guess as an adult saying it out loud, it's, it, it becomes more to light now than ever. Um, but yeah, as we, we moved on to one location, uh, to the next, to the next, uh, kind of just trying to find another home. Um, mom was doing her best to take care of us because we were all homeschooled. Luckily we could, you know, pick up our stuff and go. Um, but yeah, it was a lot. I could, could only imagine the, the pressure she was under to do what she felt was best. I, I kind of always compared it as like a, you know, a mother bear taking care of her cubs. Um, we, we went from one place to another, to another, finally settled, uh, in a, in a place. And, uh, at that point, you know, I'd been getting phone calls from my dad, uh, saying, Jake, you know, um, there's bigger things at play here right now. You know what the right thing to do is. And I'm there like, what, 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 what is the right thing to do? I don't understand. I thought, you know, we were supposed to be a family and we're all, you know, this, these Christian values are supposed to be, we stick together. Um, and then that's where the confusion, I think, started to sit settle in with me um, and started to play on my my brain. Um, at that point, I, I kind of believed that the more that saying of, you know what the right thing to do is, I began to think, well, then that would mean that I'm supposed to leave mom and go back to dad. Um, and at that time, I guess 2004, 2005, there wasn't really any rules about what kids could or couldn't do in the family. Um, and I just remember being told this by even my dad's friends that would reach out to me and talk to me and say, Hey, Jake, you know, you gotta, you gotta do what's right. You know, your dad's really suffering right now. And I remember hearing things like, um, your mother only did this to, uh, cause me to, you know, try and commit suicide or, or things like that. And it was just like, really? Like, I don't, we don't really know. Sure. Uh, okay. That sounds horrible. Wow. That's, that's a bad thing. And it eventually I think took a toll on us and me being the oldest, um, you know, I, I thought I was doing what was right. And I remember reaching out to one of my dad's friend's sons and saying, look, I need to get out of here. This isn't where I should be. Mom's this, 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 and this, um, and I don't know if she was, it was just what we were told. So yeah, I remember making that text or phone call to, to my buddy at the time. And he came and drove down and parked his car. And I remember packing my bags the night before and just ran off. Uh, I remember yelling bye mom. And she was on the phone. I take it at this time. She knows she's just looking for support. Um, you know, we just thought she was ignoring us because she's always on the phone. But as an adult, we see, you know, we don't really know what, what a parent's going through at that time and uh i'd like to say i'm sorry to my mom you know for running on her and i've always looked back at it as like maybe there could have been a life that i could have lived or developed a person that i would have developed into that i don't know today but i'm thankful for where i am now and it's it's really 
it's made me who I am now. And I'm just happy to be at a place where I'm not, you know, in a, a jail or an institution and, uh, or, or, you know, or even worse dead. And I'm able to talk about this and, and share it. So yeah, at that point, we, we, I was 15, 16, left mom and began the exodus mm -hmm. to dad. I remember running away. And uh, I think over the next couple of years, uh, slowly, my brother also did the same thing. He ran away. It was a little bit different then because the police were involved and he tried to keep him from going up to my dad. And he actually had to stay at a friend's house. He wasn't allowed to live with my dad until things got settled between the courts. Um, I, me being the oldest, there was no real court documents. It was just, well, Jake just left. What, what do we do? And I think mom was still figuring out what to do. She didn't know. Um, yeah. And then kind of just life progressed at that point. I ended up living with my dad for seven years and not talking to my mom, uh, being fed more information about, you know, what your mother did, you know, there was some miscarriages throughout the, the marriage. And, uh, I remember being told that mom had purposely caused the miscarriages, you know, maybe, I don't know if the term abortion was used, but it might've been, you know, she aborted those babies by not taking care of herself or whatever. And I'm just like, wow, that's, that's a lot to hear about a mom with a horrible mother. And that eventually took its toll on me to the point where I just cut her out as I'm not talking to her anymore. I'm done. Um, there was no real punishment or anything. If I talked to her or threatened to, it was just that implied language of, you know, you know what the right thing to do is and don't be doing that. Um, so I didn't. And yeah, at that point, I lost touch with my mom. Um, okay, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Let's break it down a little bit. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make sure I don't miss anything. So mm. you are the oldest in your among your siblings, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, so it seems like your parents uh, had a separation, and your mother, it seemed, putting in some kind of. Um, restraining order against your father and got custody of all of you guys she and did to move away or um, tried to yeah yeah, yeah. um so i wanted to ask um you were 15 at the time right yeah, yeah so um you were living in your family and you were homeschooling so you didn't go to school a lot um mm -hmm. did you witness or recall witnessing you know your father's you know, as in terms of his temper, as in terms of, you know, did he beat up your mother that you knew of? There was none of that. It was a very Christian home. So it was, you know, anything that happened, I think, was behind closed doors. Um, yeah, it, it, I, I got a feeling that there were some things going on maybe in the church or, you know, between parents or other families that, you know, maybe mom knew about that should have been dealt with uh, maybe in the community. And there were things that were being pushed under the rug in other families that um, I think mom really wanted to take a stand on and say, this is wrong. We can't be living like this. This is, you know, against, you know, I'd say God's rule or just it's not love anymore and it needs to change. And I feel like that's where mom felt maybe uh, trapped, uh, couldn't do anything and needed some type of freedom or just the ability to make better choices for her family and couldn't do it. And I feel like it got to that point and that's that was her breaking point maybe I, I yeah but but mom dad was never really physically abusive there was no nothing really of that i mean i could grow up there were some instances where there was a strict you know things like uh things that didn't make sense maybe uh there were there was some incidents as a child where um <laughs> i always laughed about it but i realized it's not a laughing matter there was a little china cabinet that had a little glass figurine on it and sometimes we walked by it enough times it would rattle and dad came home one day from work and noticed that it was like that and lined us kids all up and said, all right, who did this? And none of us had did it. Um, but he basically singled out the three oldest and said, Kate, you guys are out uh, at like, I don't know, 10, 10, what are we, 10, nine and, and seven, maybe uh, minus 40 weather. We packed up and walked. We didn't know what we were doing. We basically all pointed the finger at each other and said, somebody take the blame. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, uh, looking back at it now, maybe that's a sign of some issues that are going on behind the scenes that we don't really understand. Um, but mom did, you know, go driving after us to, to pick us up and, you know, bring us back home. Um, but that was really like the one incident that really stood out the most out of anything in our childhood. It wasn't any one thing, I think, on us. And it could have just been, I don't know, maybe personality issues um, for him and, or, or not able to deal with things in a, in a way that that would be better for everyone. I don't know. So um, 
I, I do understand that you feel um and you eventually actually uh, abandon your mother and follow yeah. your father. Uh, but that particular incident, uh, you guys moving out and the police turning up to enforce, you know, your father not having custody of you guys anymore. Um, that is puzzling to me. Um, I, I know that you view that your mother as a victim, but that actually made me kind of asking the question of what's going on. I wonder if you ever had a chance to see any of the court document back then. It's funny you say that. I was up all night trying to find some type of copy of it on, uh, I can't remember, the, the Canadian CLLL website. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find it. My mother did offer me uh, access to it at one point, and I, I never accepted it. So now, you know, the day before, I'm thinking I should look into that. And you, you might have something there. There might be something there. And, uh, you know, that might have been the beginning of maybe the conflict of maybe dad knowing that wasn't the right way to do things on my mom's side of things, but mom also seeing that she didn't have any other choice, you know, or didn't believe she had another choice because she wasn't really allowed to talk to people outside the home. Um, she wasn't really allowed to, to, to get help outside of our, you know, church circle. Um, and it really made it hard, I think, for her to find help in the community or just anywhere. Can you um, clarify that? You said that she was not allowed to talk to other people outside of the home. Or yeah, basically there was, I mean, mom, mom's always told us that we grew up in kind of like a cult-like scenario of the church. And it does make the parental alienation issue a little bit more complicated because a little deeper than just that. Um, and that's where I guess I kind of get a little confused as to, to why she did what she did. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's it was her choice. And, and that, that's all I, I looked at it as. Um, but yeah, I know that she would, she would kind of disappear in the evenings. And I found out later as an adult that she would kind of go to a computer cafe and just try to research, you know, what's going on in the home. What can I do to, to do better things? And I, I got a feeling like dad used those situations as ways to say, look at your mother. She's out, you know, running around doing whatever she's up to, uh, guys. And, and, you know, what kind of mother does that? And, and I, I really feel there was some deeper issues in the marriage that, you know, obviously didn't concern us, but it, it didn't seem like there was any will counseling or anything going on between them if there was issues and yeah there might have been a better way to go about you know uh running away from the family maybe on mom's part maybe she could have left on her own um but i i, I don't know like as a mother she, that was you know we were her kids and i don't think any mother would do that but you know that's just my experience i uh Sometimes, sometimes this happens, uh, and and it's not. It's you know, life is never clear cut. Um, uh, a lot of the time, targeted parents um, play a, a role in this. Um, and yeah, I mean, as parents, we don't, we're not given a an instruction booklet. Um, you know, children came, and we just do whatever we think is best. And um, sometimes doesn't mean that it's. Um, is right. Um, so in your situation, it seems that, um, I mean, and we, we obviously don't have the full picture and I definitely don't want mm -hmm. to be in a role uh, of victim blaming at all. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there. And, um, but um, yeah, there's definitely something about how you guys were removed from your fathers and it's questionable whether that's the right thing. And it seemed like uh, and especially with you not being able to recall anything abusive about your fathers and then suddenly removing you guys from your fathers. Um, and then also the question about the police asking, you know, whether your father had guns, uh, it seemed like he was being seen or framed as being abusive, uh, even though you you were 15, so you, you're pretty old and you're, you're homeschooling. <sighs> So you're not like, you know, you're missing from home for a block of time that you're not knowing. And I don't know how big your home were, but, you know, with seven of you guys as children, I, I'm going to assume that if something going on, there's going to be stuff that you guys would kind of be aware of in some way, even if you don't know the full story. So mm -hmm. it seems to me that your father may not have been abusive, but yet he was framed as being abusive. Yeah, definitely for the physical aspect. I know there was a lot of claims. And I think when I did go through the court documents, because I know later on down the years as an adult, I was 22 when I did reach out to my mother and reconnect. Um, we'll get to that, I'm sure. 
Um, but it was more about uh, what how did mom say the the psychological and uh, spiritual abuse that was really played a part on her side, uh, and that's I think what may have played a part in the you know using the police and she really feared that she couldn't leave. Um, that's I think the most that I can really shed any light on for us for why the police were there. Um, cause I know dad was at work, right? Like, like there's no way he would have known that we were leaving. Um, but at the same time, you know, there were neighbors in the area and I remember dad saying, well, you know, mom, you're not allowed to go talk to that person anymore. Just, you know, stop doing that, you know, stay at home. That's your role. That's what you do. You take care of the kids kind of thing. And it was just like, okay, well, if that's what dad says, that's how it goes. And being homeschooled and being in such a strict Christian, you know, kind of secluded lifestyle that that's all, you know, so that's, Okay, well, that's how it is, I guess. Oh, Lord, I'm messy. Oh, no. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, we got a Candace. Hi. We have another person that's joining. Um, okay. Candace, hi. Hi. Hi, it's Cadence. How are you? Cadence, okay. Thank you. Hi, good. Um, I want to make sure we have the right question. Uh, Cadence, oh, yeah, you're one of the eliminated uh adult children right um um i'm so sorry um i didn't oh lord my connection stable is on my connection is unstable crap um probably because i'm getting so many text messages at once um can y'all hear me okay yes yes we can hear you okay good sorry um pardon can you hear us? Okay, now I can. I'm so sorry about that. I've been having some technical difficulties trying to get my uh, laptop up and running. Apparently, there's something wrong with the charger, and I have about 46% battery left. So hopefully, I'm able to contribute something before it dies because my puppy chewed the charger. Oh, I'm sorry. She's really cute, so it's okay. I'm not that mad. It's all good. And it was just, Jacob thinks I'm funny. Um, just a few days ago, so yeah, it's all good. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't entirely prepared. I did read over the uh, the questions and everything that y'all had to ask, but um, I'm I'm more or less in it to support. Um, I I have no problem sharing my story, but I don't know where we're at in the meeting right now because I'm so late. Because that's I don't have an excuse. It's who I am as a person now. It is, it's okay. Hold on. Uh, I wanted to ask, do you have multiple devices going on right now? Can we mute one of them? Because it's a echo on your end. Um, I can try to turn off the, the Bluetooth speaker. Yeah. One moment. Okay, let me see if I can get the volume all the way up and see if I can still hear you guys. All right, are we good? Can you all hear me? Yeah, you're, you're good. Can you hear yeah. us? Yes. Okay, I think. Okay, I think. Yeah, I think it's gone now. Yeah, I think it's gone now. It's very, it's very quiet. On that's why I had the Bluetooth connected uh, for the speaker guy. Because this computer doesn't make very much noise. It's very quiet, and I'm hard of hearing anyway. Okay. Um. Okay. So. Uh, Okay, this is a problem because we like it's echoing back. I, I have an idea. I have an idea. And I'm sorry. No, I'm gonna try this number and right. I might I might have something figured out. Hang on. All right. How about now? Okay, can you hear us? Can you hear yeah. Us? Okay, good. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you so much, everyone, for being so patient. Uh, you guys could could hear Cadence, okay, right? Uh, in the chat room, let us know. Okay, so Cadence, um, let's just get you on board as quickly as possible. Uh, how old were you when the alienation started? And um, was it your mother or your father that was a targeted parent? Okay, so my parents divorced when I was about two years old. Uh, my brother was a year old, and uh, it was my mother who kept us away from my father, who I now thankfully have a phenomenal relationship with, 
but now I'm in a custody battle over my own daughter against my mother. We're talking 30 years worth of this. I'm for sorry. lack of a better term, it's this. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, thank you. And thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing your story. We're gonna focus mostly on your personal story as an alienated child. Um, so you said sure. your, uh, your parents divorced when you were two and your mother kept you away from your father. Um, like was your father far away? What did your mother do to prevent you from seeing your father? Okay, so my mother, and I'm sure you've heard this before, she is the classic covert narcissist. Um, she's the protective parent. It's that whole kind of pathology that Dr. Childress talks about. Um, she led me to believe that my father was abusive when he was not. I have no true memories of my dad as a little kid, except for the song Can't Help Fallen in Love by Elvis Presley. For some reason, I always identified with that song, come to find out 20 some years later, that was the first song that my dad sang to me. And yeah, it was, it was really messed up. Um, she used the courts. She's still using the courts uh, to alienate my own daughter from me. It's definitely a pattern. I'm working with the guardian ad litem. I'm working with the sheriff's department. I'm working with everybody involved in the court system to try and get the rats out because so I, I shouldn't have been in this court system for 30 years. So with your father and your mother, um, she made you believe that he was abusive. So you chose not to see him or, or how is it that you did not see? Your right, I was, right. I was terrified of him. She, uh, she taught me a bunch of things or she told me a bunch of things about him that were not true. Um, she implanted false memories. Well, all what, these what kind of things? Awful did, psychological things. What kind of things did she uh, She told me he used to beat me. He used to beat me. He used to beat her. He was just abusive in every way, shape and form. He was an alcoholic. Now at 32 years old, I've gotten to know my dad very well. And after two beers, he's wasted. Like the guy cannot hold his liquor. He cannot be an alcoholic. There's no way he doesn't have it in him. And at 32, I now know the truth. I know my, who my dad is. He's a wonderful person. He's just he's never met an enemy other than my mother and that's because my mother is her own worst enemy she can't see through her own shadow she okay. has no idea how toxic she really is okay um we're gonna try to focus on the specific activities and let's avoid the generalization generalization of um you know trying to diagnose people um so i think let's uh, stay on the specific activities or action or things that happen um but okay so you were two and you were told that your father was abusive physically abusive to her and to you and so you chose not to see him you were afraid of him um right do you ever see him trying to meet, see you or meet you yes um my dad never gave up and I got to give him credit for that. He showed up at every opportunity, even when he was told not to be there. And even though I was terrified of him and, and you know, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with him, he never, he never stopped caring. Like he stayed there. He fought in court for, shoot, 15 years. So um, what until was I was the, emancipated. Yeah. What was through specifically what happened? Like, let's say your father turned up and then what happened? I would run from him. Um, I remember a very traumatic to me at the time. Now looking back, it's, it should not have been traumatic. But when I was in fifth grade, he showed up, he had talked to my fifth grade teacher and she allowed him into the classroom. And I remember being like 10 years old, I was terrified of him. Like I thought he was gonna beat me. I thought he was gonna take me and all these other things. Um, my mother tried, you know, to move us out of the country. I think the court blocked her from doing that, either that or the job opportunity never arose. But um, she tried to get away from him, but he was always within a 30 minute drive of us. And he had a relationship with my brother growing up. My brother was not as alienated as I was. And I know you're not into the diagnosing thing, but if we're really talking, you know, I, I was the scapegoat child. I was the one that was blamed for everything, but I started out as the golden child and I was protected. 
Yeah, so, but, um, so what happened that day? My your brother father, wasn't afraid of him. I was. Your father? Oh, I was terrified. I, I. What did you do? He showed up in school. He, I, I avoided him. I wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't make eye contact with him. Um, I was crying. I remember being absolutely terrified because I didn't know who this guy was. I just knew what I'd been told about him. And I believed it because I had been brainwashed as a little one. Like it started when I was a baby. Okay. It was awful. And I, I didn't know any better then. Okay. So Kim, what about, what about you? Did you know if your mother ever tried to reach out to you during that time? Oh, you're on mute, by the way. There we go. So when my, um, my mother realized what had happened, she, um, I think she tried to call, she was write letters. She actually came to Colorado um, once um, she had to hire a private investigator to find us. She um, went actually to the church we belong to. We belong to a Catholic church. The priest actually called and warned us. So they moved us again. And then she also went to the courthouse to the police because now we know that an abduction is against the law. Back then, they were told in 1976 that they don't get um, involved in domestic affairs. So there was no one to help her. She was still determined. She would still send cards. She actually took out ads in the newspaper telling us that she loved us and she missed us and yeah, all kinds. She did everything she could. So wow. um, I'm sorry. Yeah. So she wrote to you guys and you got the letters and the cards so you could see it. Yeah. And I don't know. If we, I don't know if we got all of them. We did see some things come in. I remember seeing them. I don't know if we I don't remember, honestly, if we were allowed to even read the cards or receive the gifts. I don't remember any of that. But we were told that I have some recollection of things coming in the mail, yes. And then uh, you also said that your mother took out an ad in the newspaper to let yes. your wife know that she loved you. Do you yes, see yes. that? We did, yes, yes. And how did you feel? That was, um, that was very conflicting. I mean, I think a part of us wanted to believe that that was true, but that we were so brainwashed and so scared to believe any of that, that we, we, um, I don't remember how I felt, honestly, I was scared to acknowledge it. I was afraid to acknowledge that I had seen it because we never talked about it with my dad. Never, ever talked about it with him. Um, that, that was, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Let's, let's walk back a little bit. So your situation started with you loving your mother she was the only caretaker that you had you were taken away abruptly from your mother kidnapped yes how fast did it take to the point where you now said you were brainwashed and you're very, not sure if your mother really loved you very quickly very quickly, very quickly. because because of the threat of, of them hurting us and killing us we were threatened we lived in Colorado, we were in the mountains a lot, and we were threatened many times to be left there to die. So we knew our survival. I don't know how we knew it, but as kids, you just do whatever you need to do to survive. We knew our survival was based on believing and acknowledging and adhering to whatever rules they put into place. So we had to believe that in order to survive. I honestly believe that if I had done anything different, I would have been, I, I don't think I'd be here today. I honestly believe that because of the level of threat and the level of abuse that happened in our home. So the threats was very real. Oh, they were physical, emotional, mental. They were, they were, they were everything you can imagine. Yes, yes. But yet you actually somehow it actually changed the way you feel about your mother. Somehow you actually felt like actually your mother don't love you, didn't love you anymore. Yeah, I. Um, we were told that she did so many bad and horrible things that we never saw, but yet we, we didn't have any other recourse but to believe them. At 10 years old, you believe what you're told. And they were very convincing. So very quickly from, because there's a few things that are actually going on actually. One is the isolation. You were taken away from your mother. So that isolation from your, your mother. The other thing is the, the threats 
instilling the fear for you to obey. And then another thing is a brainwashing to say that your mother was bad for you, that your mother does things that you don't even know. So gaslighting as well to rewrite the history of how you view your mother and, you know, even think about, you know, oh, you didn't know there's a stuff that she did that you didn't know. So you mm -hmm. now question your reality. Yes. So at that point, your mother reach out and it still, it, it doesn't work we yeah we i mean we we were told we couldn't contact her so i don't know how we would have been able to we couldn't call her we couldn't obviously drive there we had we had been cut off from all of the family that we knew here in wisconsin we, we've been cut off from everyone our grandparents i mean every family member that we knew that we had been brought up with we were in this strange world with nobody but my father and his wife that we knew and each other there was there was her brother sister and i so that was it that was it. So um, I think, like I said, you do what you needed to do to survive. And that's what I've been told by my psychologist for years. You survived on whatever you needed to do to get through that moment. And um, I can't, I can't even share what the, I can't even, I repressed so much of the abuse that I can't, I can't even, I can't even bring it to words. Let's just put it that way. Um, but the reunion was pretty, um, it was pretty scary as well when we were finally reunited with our mom. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, your story actually have a good ending that you, you reunion with your mother, but, um, that, but that, that just... good, and I just want to, that good ending was very brief because of all that mental health issues that were everywhere afterwards. So we've never, ever fully recovered. And I don't speak with my mom, my dad, or either of my siblings because of what happened. Wow. So it's, it's ruined all of our lives. I mean, horribly. Okay, so you reunion, we reunited with your mother, but that still didn't work. The damage is done. It's too late. Yeah, we were good for a while, but my mom's mental health was so declined for so long. I mean, um, once she realized we weren't coming back, the Christmas tree that she had up when we left stayed up for three years before she took it down. So her, her mental health was, I mean, it declined and she never sought the help that she needed to recover from that. None of my siblings did and my father is still just a, I've tried to have a relationship with them, but it's impossible. I've tried to do a good job. Yeah, this is very common. I know a lot of target parents cannot even bear to clean up the child's room. You left things yeah. as it is because it's so painful that a lot of parents will just, you know, the toys that the child left out in the middle of the room or the shirt or whatever it is, the parents don't want to, to pack up that room. You can't go back in there because it's too painful. And so this is exactly what happened to Kim's mother, is that she had that Christmas tree that she was waiting for Kim to, and, and um, did you have, you, you have siblings? A brother and a sister, yes. Are they younger or older than you? One is older and one is younger. Okay. An older brother, a younger sister. Okay, so yeah, she sure. and she And she said that she didn't want to move and she didn't change her number because she never, she always wanted us to be able to come back and she, because we knew where we lived because we lived in the same place for years. So, but I can't imagine how painful that was for her as well. Yeah, so yeah, she, she couldn't move. She didn't want to change her phone number. Like Ma, Ma, Malina in the chat room said, yes, my kids' room are still the same. Christmas tree still up. Yeah, it's that's the problem. Um, and then when there was a situation, I mean, we knew um, one of the parents of the, that we actually do know um, she had to move because she got evicted. It was so painful for her to pack up her child's bedroom that Claudia in our team actually helped her pack up that room because she had to move and how painful that is. Um, so yeah, it, it's really traumatic. But can you go back to, you said, so you were threatened. Um, there was real threats of your safety if you ever dare to reach out to her. But there's also brainwashing. Could you talk about, can you give us maybe one or two examples of what they said about your mother? 
Um, they said that um, they said her mom was um, sleeping around, that she never took care of us, that she, um, you know, wasn't healthy mentally, didn't have the intelligence, all those different things. So, you know, things along those lines. And there's a piece of that that was true, but um, there's also a piece of, they don't know the extent that she did to also try to take care of us, knowing that my father wasn't paying the child support or all these other things. So not that I'm making excuses for her, but I know she was doing the best she could, even based on her childhood and what she experienced as a child as well. So I've come to recognize that she did the best that she could. But what he did was, um, yeah, that, there's no excuse for that. There will never be an excuse for that. Never. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? There's no perfect parent. There's, there's no. no perfect human being. And that's what alienators do, is they try to target something um some some something simple and then they completely twist it and then take it out of control out of um yeah out of context and then now it become a huge thing and really you know it could just be a simple thing uh, and the damage to the children could have been nothing, but because now that it's taken out of context and completely blown out of proportion, it become a huge shadow in the child's mind and it becomes such an impact in the child's psyche. Um, okay. So one of the things, one of the things that they did right away uh, within, uh, even within weeks when they told us that they, um, that we were never going to see our mother again. They also instructed us to call my dad's wife, mom. Oh. So, so they tried to banish our, my real mom. From yeah. So that's also very common is to make the step parents a replacement for you. Um, and, she was, and she was pure evil. She was pure evil. Yes. And evil. getting, yeah, getting the children to call the step parents mom or dad. Yeah, that's that's a um, that's a big no no, but they do that. Um, okay, so why don't we go back to Jake? Um, Jake, do you want to continue? Uh, and I'm sorry. So we were talking about um, you got pack up and then you move away. Um, can you tell us? So you said you didn't know what was going on. Uh, what did your mother say about your father when she took you guys away? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I was more, I guess, I guess to hear the question again, could like, did, what did my mother say about my father? Nothing. Um, yeah, well, of course we, we couldn't, I just see it happening, but mom never said anything bad about dad. It was just, you know, we'd, we'd say things and there'd be that look on mom's face and she would just say nothing. And you could see the pain and I, I guess I got to thank her for that, but maybe she had some counseling or some advice to just not do that. Um, but I don't know. Um, all I knew was all the information that was coming in my years was from my dad or my dad's friends. So I left and that was enough for me to, you know, completely cut her out of my life. Um, to the point where, yeah, she'd send me birthday cards, uh, birthday text messages, all that stuff. And I would never acknowledge them. Uh, I received them 100%. They were never blocked for me. Uh, but I never felt the need to say thank you or appreciate them or let, um, I guess, let her know that, you know, it was nice to get them because I didn't think that it was nice. I thought it was, oh, she's just trying to win me back, even though she's completely wronged all of us by doing what she did. And you know, I, I kind of thought about what you said, maybe there was maybe not the best way to go about leaving. Um, but that maybe didn't maybe play out in her favor. But in the end, it, it ended up basically just showing her position and me moving back up to where, you know, dad's place was, I got myself involved into uh, public school, uh, started playing ice hockey, I got involved in uh, refereeing, ice hockey refereeing. Uh, and really just kind of developed more as an individual. Um, didn't really go back to church more just like, a, okay, so the family is done. Um, interesting. And a lot of it was uh, your mother, this, your mother, that, and, you know, we're like, okay, well, yeah, she's to blame. She's the one that left. 
Um, and then, you know, as I grew older, um, you know, I start meet, meeting friends now because now we're no longer secluded. We're not locked into our homes. Not that we were literally locked. It was just, you know, we're, we're homeschooled. It's, that's the life that dad wanted for us. And it was, it was, it was great. Um, and then the, yeah, the divorce happens and you're kind of just like, all right, well, whatever comes next at me, let's, let's, it'll just be nice to do something or, or talk to people. And I think that was when I started seeing other families and seeing other parents or kids that were divorced. And there was still this, like, what do you mean your parents are divorced and they still talk to each other? You can like go to your moms and your mom asks you how your dad's doing and your dad ask you how mom's doing but like they don't talk like that sounds weird why why how does that work like what do i gotta do to have that happen in my family um and then i feel like i almost took on this like hey well there's something that i can do maybe i was wrong for helping my mom leave um and then it became more of a well i just got to take care of myself at this point there's there's nothing that i can do um you know, I, I focused more on school and just myself developing. Um, as I, I think, made it through grade 11, grade 12, and then graduated, that was where I was kind of, all right, dad, what do I do? Because now I'm basically looking at dad as everything. Um, and he just said, well, once you graduate, just go get a job. That's that's all you need. Um, you know, grow to realize maybe I needed a little more, maybe secondary, post-secondary schooling would have been nice. Um, but yeah, I just, I literally did that, got a job. Um, I remember graduation mom was basically begging uh, to come to my grad and I kept saying, no, you're not invited. You're not allowed. Um, I don't want you there. Even if you show up, I'm not going to acknowledge you. Um, so she went to the efforts of making a YouTube video, um, which is still on YouTube today. It's on my little brother's account. Um, if anyone's interested, I'll throw it into a chat later, but uh I remember watching it over and over and over and uh, oh, I'm not going to remember the song that she put to it. Uh, I, I will remember you. Uh, is that Sarah McLaughlin? Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, uh, she basically did a slideshow of my entire life as much as she had seen, um, you know, from the childhood growing up until, you know, the family being together. And then all of a sudden I'm not there and then it's nothing. And I remember watching it being like, wow, she literally just lost her son. Like I, I'm gone. And I'd be being the oldest. I, 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 even at that stage, I was still, you know, still, you know, believing that she was a horrible person and all that stuff. Um, I was like, why would a horrible person make something like this? Like that, that doesn't add up. Then I started kind of questioning things. The other thing that played a lot on me was the relationships I'd get into. So, right. You know, you get a girlfriend, the girlfriend says, how's your mom? And your response is, oh, I don't talk to her. She's this, 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 and this. And they're like, well, mothers aren't like, are you sure? I'm like, well, that's what my dad always said. So it's got to be true. And, you know, they, the girls that I would date, they never really pushed too hard on it. Um, but eventually, I think it started to take a little toll on me because they'd ask, you know, maybe you just should need to go talk to her. Maybe there's something there. And that's where I would say thank you to those women or girls that were in my life at that point that really made me question my reality. Uh, or what my reality was painted as. And um, so, JJ, yeah. can, can we go back a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So before you left your mother, yeah. um, uh, there was your father and your father's friends that talked yeah. to you. Do yeah. you recall specific things that they said that made you feel like your mother was so bad? At, at, at one point, uh, actually, when I was moving, living in well, I guess this is later on when we reunited. I actually did contribute a statement to the courts um, where I got to take the time to basically just think back on it. So I do have some notes here. Um, but basically, it's it was all the same kind of language. There was no real, uh, your mother is this. It's just, I'm not telling you what to do, but you know what the right thing to do is. It was a lot of loaded language. Um, more about the fact that my mother was out being promiscuous and just wanted to do her own thing and didn't want to stay with dad. And don't you know that the Bible says, you know, you're supposed to stay with the family. The only reason you should leave is under, I guess, duress of, uh, you know, sexual misconduct or, you know, those kind of things. And it was like, well, if that's the case, then mom had to have been stepping out because that's the only reason she would have left. So, you know, when you use religion or, or the Bible as a way to enforce that and, and me growing up, I was the oldest, I, I was really, 
I, I, I don't want to say I fell for it, but I believed in it, right? The, 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 the concept of faith, hope, and love being everything that, that life should be about. I, I'm, I'm in on that. I like that. It sounds great. Um, so when the family kind of fell apart, I'm sitting there like, well, mom obviously didn't want that because that's what it lines up with. Well, then yeah, she should be cut out or, you know, I don't need her anymore kind of thing. Um, I don't know if that answers that. And that was like, yeah, dad's friends. It wasn't really bashing mom or telling her that she was an evil person. It was more just like she has the devil inside of her kind of thing. So maybe that was it. But at the same time, like I didn't exactly understand the devil as anything meaning something. I thought that was just their terms of saying, you know, don't talk to her. You know, she's not good for you kind of thing. And I believe them. It was, there was no reason for me not to believe them at that point as a, a young adult or, you know, a teenager, okay, well, fine. I'll just put my head down and focus on school and hockey and friends and relationships. And yeah, that's where I mentioned the relationships were what kind of brought it back. Cause like, Oh, geez, I could have a, more relationships kind of thing. Yeah. So with Kim's situation, um, it was very blatant outright, uh, you know, um, don't you dare talking to her. Uh, she's bad. Here's why she's bad. Uh, with Jacob, it's a little bit more subtle. It's like, you know what to do, empowering you, right? You feel, and especially you being the oldest child, you know what to do. You know the right thing. Come on, look at the religion. We've been taught, right? So you're now empowering, inappropriately empowering the child to supposedly act like an adult. So you feel like, Oh, good boy. I'm making the right decision here. I'm going to be the adult and I'm going to leave her. Yeah. So, and you couldn't recall anything that your mother did to try to alienate your father other than the move away, but she didn't talk bad about him. She didn't um, prevent him from being able to send you or contact you or talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you recall this bad mouthing about your mother. And so you made that decision. Now with Cadence, um, there was this full on campaign of, yeah, your father was abusive, your father is uh, violent and he's uh, an alcoholic, which she found that he's not an alcoholic. Okay, so there's a whole range of things that are going on here. Um, okay, so you, um, so Kim knew that this was wrong back then she loved her mother but then it still get to a point where she had doubt jacob felt like he didn't know that it was wrong he felt like he's doing the right thing by by rejecting his mother um i wonder and then cadence um i think cadence are you still there um i think cadence felt like she she was just scared. So I think she doesn't know her dad. She, she it started so young. She didn't know. She turned her video off. She turned her video off because her. Yeah. Um, oh, wait. I, I'm sorry. I. Uh, Y'all turned my video off. Um, can you turn your video on? No. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, okay. Cadence? Okay, there's something there's something going on. I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh wow, that's really rough. All right, y'all stopped my video. The host stopped my video. I'm I'm trying to Actually, no, I'm trying to ask you to start the video. I'm keep clicking it, but it's not, it doesn't seem to work. No, I click ask to, maybe I click something wrong. Cause I actually clicked to ask to start video. Um, let me see. Yeah, you can't. Okay, there's something going on. Yeah. Okay. I'm, um, I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. That's okay. 
Um, I guess my question was, was there any point in your childhood where you felt like that was wrong, that you're not seeing your father? Okay, why don't we just move on to Kim? Um, oh, look at that. I think she's back. Oh, there you go. Your video's back, but now you're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. Okay, all right. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm using the hotspot on my phone and I do apologize for the interruptions. Um, my friend was here. She's a retired Air Force Colonel. She's going to court with me on Friday to fight for custody of my daughter who just showed up with her dad and her cousin and my roommate. So there's about to be some chaos, but I'm going to step outside for a few moments and try to negate the energy for the duration of this meeting so that we can yeah, actually Hidden, get something done. Um, Hiddens, why don't we come back with you um, next month in the next event, okay? And then um, that, we'll start that be... from the beginning so that we can actually focus on your story. I think that um, it's like, yeah, and then that way you can focus on what's going on with you. So yeah, we'll see you. Yeah, I don't get to see my daughter. I don't get to see my daughter very often because we're going through the same parental alienation thing now with my mother. That's why we're going to court next Friday. Um, okay. So yeah, it is a cycle. It needs to be broken. Okay. Um, why don't we just continue with this and we'll catch up with her another time? I mean, I apologize. Um, okay. So. Okay, so Kim, um, um, let me just get my thoughts back. <sighs> okay, so, okay, Kim, so as you were growing up um, and you, you start to get brainwashed, um, you start to question your reality because now your reality is being rewritten, um, you're being gaslighted. So was there any point that you were still yearning for your mother was there any point that you still that you started to question that it was wrong or honestly i was just trying to survive i kept so busy i um i was involved with our church i was a straight a student i was working i was playing sports i was not in the house as much as i could be i was um I, I was just trying to survive. I didn't want to be at home, so I wasn't at home much, but I was so restricted with my movements that um, yeah, I still had to be there. I mean, we're talking an environment that I, I could watch 30 minutes of TV a night. I mean, I had to do this, I had to do that. So it was so restricted, it was so constricted. So no, I was trying to survive. I um, gave up, I think, on seeing my mom again until I was older, because I had to focus on just getting through just getting through each day and not being in danger. I had to not put myself in danger. I had to do the right thing all the time. And even when I did the right thing, I still got in trouble. So it was um, it was very a very conflicting environment. So you no, know, I um, I had to put that I had to put that aside. I just I was in survival mode for as as a kid, I was in survival mode. I lived in such trauma that every day I'm in such danger that um, that's it's changed everything for me. So actually both Kim and Jacob and me, uh, we did the same thing. And this is what you see a lot is that alienated children, when you look at them from the outside, you think that they're great because they're functional, right? You're both active at school, you're doing well at school, the same with me, you know, with straight A student, you're very proactive. So alienated parents and actually outsider will point to that child and say, see, there's no problem. The child's doing so well, there must be no abuse. This must be the right thing to just keep the child away from the targeted parents and leave the child with the alienators. But 
you what you don't see inside is what exactly what Kim is saying. She's just trying to survive and she's trying to keep her, her mind occupied with everything else and trying to be okay. And in some way, that's your escape mechanism. You're trying to do well at school because somehow that make it okay for the rest of your life. Like, you know, try to cover other aspects of your life. And the same with Jacob, he's, you know, he's playing sport and he got into relationships and that's sort of keeping him busy. And the same with me. I was like straight A student. I was doing all this thing and I was working, just just trying to be okay. And and what you don't see is a trauma inside. So Kim, you mentioned a little bit, and, and let's dig in a lot more now about the abuse that you were enduring in that environment with the alienated family. Yeah, that's that's hard to talk to, but it's um it was it was physical. It was from the point of having bruises from the point of, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Um, it was emotional. It was gaslighting every day. It was walking on eggshells because one day you would do something and it was okay. The next day you do the same thing and it was wrong. So you never knew from one day to the other, from one day to the other, if it was going to be okay. You never knew what was going to set. It was especially the, um, and I never called her my stepmom because she was just evil, but um, she was the worst in the um, relationship. And I never understood why my father never protected me from her. It was so point, it was so bad at one point where she had moved out of the house um, because they were separating. She had come back into the house and um, I was never supposed to have money in my purse. And I was working. I was what, 15, 16 years old. She found the money in my purse. She threw away all of my um, products that I had, like for you know, feminine kind of stuff. She threw away everything I had. And then she came at me and she kicked me as I was on the floor. She kicked me in my shoulder. And then um, I ran from her. She tackled me and we started fighting. Like she tried to beat the hell out of me. And my father stood in the doorway and watched. So that's the kind of abuse it was for so long. And she would tell me that it was worthless and her mother would tell me I would be pregnant before I was 16. It was so many different things. It was so varied because I was always thought to be a troublemaker and I wasn't. I never got in trouble. I never got in trouble. I didn't do half the stuff my kids did at, at young ages. Um, I was always trying to not get in trouble because I didn't want to get in trouble with these people. So, um, and, and that's still carried with me to this day. You know, the, the, you're seeking to, to please everyone, you're seeking to make everyone happy. That carries on through decades and decades and decades. I mean, that's, I, I, you know, this happened when I was 10 and I'm in my 50s now and I'm still doing the same damn thing. So um, it's, yeah, so those are the kind of things. I don't know if there's something specific you wanted to ask me, but mentally, emotionally, um, with, I'm so bad with interpersonal relationships, especially men, I have picked two marriages, I have two marriages with kids with both. And I am a, a two-time domestic abuse survivor because I picked men that have hurt me so bad. And they too abused me in ways that my father did. So I didn't identify that until recently why I'm doing that, but I'm hopeful or not. <laughs> so your stepmother was abusive, physically abusive to you, oh, like kicking, yeah. screaming, and then also Gotcha. emotionally abusive to you telling you that you're not going to turn out to be anything in life you're going to be worthless you're going to have uh kids as you know as teenagers and all that type of things and then withholding, love, withholding compassion withholding empathy i mean everything from the cold swimmer was cold as hell she withheld everything from me my father did the same thing because he had to satisfy her he put her first before his own children always because he never wanted to lose her I mean, it got to the point where um, they were separated when this incident happened where we beat, she beat the hell out of me and I fought back. And I never fought back before. She wanted to reconcile with my father is, is why I'm believing this happened. I don't know for sure. So my father, I was at a, a church meeting, a, um, a teen church meeting in our Catholic church. My father pulled up in our, our van and I, I'm, I'm outside, I'm talking to other teenagers my age. And he pulls up in the van, and I'll never forget this. And he gets out, he goes in the back, he pulls out a big suitcase. 
sets it down and he says to me, you need to go find somewhere else to leave, to live. And he leaves and I'm 16 years old. He chose, he chose yes. her over you. He's always chosen other women over his kids, especially me, always, always. And it took me a long time to understand that as well. So I've always tried to please him to, to be accepted by him. And I mean, I've gone on to get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and I've been successful in my professional life until recently because I've now I have this disease that is crippling and I'm sick every day of my life. So yeah, he, um, I, I, I will never understand why he did the things he did. So, oh my God. So you talk about the, you talk about the long-term impact. One of the aspects of it is that you ended up in cycle of abusive relationship because you yes. have been victimized so much that you looking at um, that as norm, you're seeking similar type of treatment and behavior. You're seeking familiar. Um, so you end up in abusive relationship one after another. Um, and this one, is Right. So one of the things that's been explained to me by, by my psychologist is I'm always looking to be accepted by my father. So I'm, I'm picking similar men with similar features or whatever. And I'm, I'm still looking to be accepted by, by my father. So I'm seeking acceptance by these other men and I'm still not getting it. I'm still being cast or asked to fit some certain role that they want to put me in, but I'm still not, I'm still not being accepted or, or feeling loved the way that I always wanted to as a kid. So that that's never left me. Um, okay, sorry, give me one second. Um... Okay, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, so okay. Um, and that's exactly the situation that I went through as well. I and I, I totally get it like you. Uh, and this is very common is that victims and especially abused children always seek to please the abuser because you you you're actually looking at yourself as like, oh, if I could just try a little bit better, my father or my mother will love me more. Um, you know, so you're trying harder instead of separate yourself from the abuser, the victim, the ch victim child would tend to actually uh, enmesh with the abuser instead of trying to separate away. Um, and that's the situation with you. I wonder back then, um, I mean, now we're talking about the long term impact of it. But what about back then? Um, did you did you, like what was it like for you? Like, did you know that you're suffering? You know, what kind of emotional like how was your emotional health back then growing up and going through that life did you see that as normal that you're being beaten up all the time and being told that you're not worth anything yeah until recently yeah so until back then you, yeah you just you just yeah. see that that's the normal way of life yeah until 2013 2014 when i got sick yeah until i got this disease yeah i did so Kim and, and you guys for the audience, this is this is crazy, but it's the reality and um, and Kim is not you. I'm, I'm saying this because this is exactly me, uh, my story. OK, is that Kim is a very accomplished woman. She's so intelligent. She's well educated. She got her degree. She got her master degree. She's successful in her career. But as a victim being victimized from such a young age it's so entrenched that she never even realized that she was abused she saw all that abuse as normal and then it continued to 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 put up with it as an adult you still see that as normal you keep doing that until it manifested into a physical illness and then you have to stop to question and then you need other people outside like therapy and education for you to go, oh, gosh, what I went through was not okay. That was abuse. You just saw that as normal. And then the same with Jacob. Jacob, you touched this a little bit earlier. You said, for you, you thought that's just normal. That's, you know, and then when you started to see other kids that were divorced and then in the divorced family, and yet they still have both of their parents. That's when you start to go, oh, is that, 
Is that how it's supposed to be? I don't have that. Why didn't I have that, right? And you talk about also, you know, your girlfriends, your relationship, people start to ask you questions that slowly it kind of give you a insight into, wow, that was not okay. That was not normal. Like, can you tell us more about the impact of this on your childhood? Like, what would you, did you notice that you were suffering and what was the, the impact back then? Yeah, there's definitely no notice. Um, because I, we didn't have anything to compare it to. And I mean, even as a young, young kids, if I think back, you know, being in the church and going over to other friends' homes, we'd have, uh, yeah, Sunday morning, you go to church. Sometimes you'd go over to your friend's place for the afternoon and then there'd be a, an evening service. So you could kind of go hang out at, you know, whoever's house and, you know, it didn't really seem anything too different. Um, every family kind of had their thing and, you know, some dads like this, some moms like this, but there was no real, no real issues. Um, you know, I'd say disciplining was still something that was taught in the church, uh, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child kind of lines. And uh, I remember growing up as a kid, there was a literal thing called the rod of correction that you could purchase from the, uh, there's a U.S. homeschooling department. Um, I'll never forget, had a little red tip at the end of it. And we always made sure that we took that off because if parents were going to use that as a disciplining tool, there's no need for that little red tip. Um but we just accepted it as like, that's, that's normal, right? That's, that's what we get if we break the law, which was then interpreted as God's law because the parents are put there by God and we just are there to obey and to honor our parents and not to question things. Um, so yeah, we, like we, we'd see that in other homes too. So it was like, okay, so it's all normal. That's, that's just the way life is. Um, you know, I believe like, you know, the more secluded you are, the easier it is to believe your version of normal is normal. Um, until you kind of go out and see things outside of your, your bubble or, or your life. Um, and that's where, as I grew up, you know, get into public school, see other people, you know, now people are swearing in the schools. Um, there's people being disrespectful to teachers and there's no punishment. Um, whoa, you guys can do all of this. That's, that's incredible. Um, I think even growing up, I, I used to question, what is the Canadian constitution? Why wasn't that taught to us? I think I'd like to know that <laughs> and got a little bit more into that, but never really went to the point of, you know, what is, you know, child abuse or what, what was I, was I abused or not? It was more or less just like, okay, well, this is just what it is. And I will keep learning and then try to keep an open ear to see what I can do to become, you know, a better person or learn what's actually going on around me in the year 20, like 2006, whatever year that was. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, it was like the, the relationships were the big kicker. Um, I even spoke to a few of my, um, old acquaintances before this and mentioned to them, I said, Hey guys, it's my first time speaking out. I, I just wanted to say, I'm thinking of you guys as I do this, because without you guys being in my life, I wouldn't have questioned where or what kind of life am I missing out on? Um, which eventually led to me, you know, asking my dad, would it be wrong of me to go and talk to my mom. And I remember being told, you know, well, you always were your mother's son kind of thing. And I was like, well, that's a loaded language. I'm like, well, okay. Are you trying to say that I'm not your son? I like, you know, how am I supposed to take that? Um, we had a bit of a heated argument and I remember standing up into Tim Hortons and saying, you just, you're not hearing me. You don't understand. And I walked out and that was, I think the last time I saw him for quite a long time. Um, then drove down to where my mother was living and, and that was where we began reconnecting. So I know not all stories have that, but uh, you know, up until that point, I was being curious with my mother uh, because of those relationships and the people asking those questions, you know, I reached out to mom and was like, so what's actually going on here? And I remember her trying to give me some information about parental alienation. And I think it was a Larry Fong might've been a psychologist that we had to actually talk to um part of the court agreement we all had to have like our psyche valve and you know we came out normal <laughs> or good whatever the term was and uh you know just moved on with our lives um and then i think there was another guy richard warshak who uh, after me and my mom kind of reconnected or, or got to know each other or just were able to like look each other in the eye and then you know speak um we then went to a couple of the seminars um but i know before that point now um, as things come back to me when I was attempting to reconnect with her because I was questioning things, uh, at that point, my little brothers had moved up to where my dad was. My sisters had been given to my mom because of the courts. And when word got back that I had visited mom and gave her a hug, 
and the hug lasted a little bit longer than it should have. Uh, that got back to dad and then got to the brothers and the brothers say, Jake, how could you do that? Um, you know, don't you realize what you're doing to dad? You're killing him basically. And I was just like, man, what are you guys fighting for him for? And at that point I was like, man, like, I, I love you guys, but like, I don't think this is our fight. Like this is, this is not on us. And you know, they can't hear that. They weren't there to listen. <laughs> so it was more or less at that point I realized, okay, I, I, this is, stuff I got to do on my own somehow I'm not sure how but one day at a time you know then I, I do what you were saying get busy again get back to hockey you know at that point maybe I'm an adult you know get into drinking doing some drugs maybe recreationally and then uh you know miss my mom again and you know the kind of the, it kind of just continues until you kind of level out at some point I guess yeah so yeah. um and uh, actually, before we go on, I really yeah. wanted to say um, how appreciative I am of both of you, Kim and Jacob, for sharing because it takes a lot to be sharing your stories. And, you know, so grateful for you guys. And just wanted to say how strong you guys are to, to survive through this, to cope with this, and to be where you are today. So, really, uh, you, you need to give yourself a pat in the back for for surviving for you know for doing the best you can you you're doing amazing job you're so strong so really thank you um and you jacob and, pointing out yes and i just want to say to you thank you for setting this up i've yeah. always i wanted to get involved in this for years and years to help people because i know that it's so hard to go through as a child and and thank you for being so brave and starting this and starting the legislation trying, trying to change the legislation and and all that, and I will do whatever I can do to help with that as well. I mean, I'm, I, I want all this change, and I want it brought to light as well. I think that that um, it's atrocious what people can do to each other, and especially their ch their children, and they're not checking on their children, and that's so heartbreaking, so heartbreaking. So thank, thank you. you so much. No, thank you so much. Um, it, it's it's so interesting um, what Jacob was talking about. How there there's no education. Um, so you didn't know what you're going through is considered child abuse. And you're talking about legislation, Kim. Uh, we're working so hard pushing legislation. Um, so one of the things that was kind of interesting, um, for example, like we one of the state that we focus a lot on is Texas, right? So in Texas, in the family code, there's one little line in this huge family code of pages and pages, right? That one little line at the beginning that said, if you cause... Um, mental or psychological injury to a child that's considered child abuse well, okay great okay you did mention that okay great but then the rest of the code it doesn't tell you what to do with it it will talk about oh you know if you beat up the child it'll be this and if you blah 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 right but there's nothing there's no punishment there's no ramification for what happened when you cause psychological or mental injury to the child even though you define it right that's in the family code and then if you go into the criminal code there's nothing about psychological abuse oh if you you know if you punish the, if you beat the child up then here's the punishment and if you sexually abuse the child blah blah but psychological abuse the law simply ignore that even though you acknowledge that it's child abuse the law does not do anything you're completely neglecting to protect the children and there's a study um that that did a study over 5,000 children on different form of abuse and they proven that psychological abuse is just as serious as sexual or physical abuse and so as a society we neglecting this huge part of the children damage and it's so serious and then recently um actually right now uh texas we have a right now this um i'm not in texas but right now in texas there's a special legislative session it's actually the second special legislative session and there's a bill that's being put forward that to do with children education at school um uh, and uh, one of the things that that the bill said is, you know, the school it's going to require the state board of education to make it a requirement for children to learn about family violence and child abuse. And we thought it was great. So then we p decided to go and testify to try to make change to that. And we said, hey, you know, you guys forgot about this. So actually, Claudia, you guys see Claudia in the chat room, yeah. she's a huge advocate 
um, in, in our team and I'm so grateful for her. So anyway, Claudia um, stood up and you know we did something that we're pushing. We're like, hey, great. We appreciate that you, you guys trying to um, put forward this thing to make it a requirement for school to make the children to get educated about child abuse and, and family violence. It's just like the way that you are today, getting children to learn about bully, right? In the past, we never teach children about that. Now the children start to learn about that. Then they start to go, oh, bully is not okay, right? So we, we need to change that. So, okay, great. You, you wanted to change the way that children think and say, okay, family violence is a problem and child abuse is a problem. Then you need to recognize that psychological abuse is a big thing. Thing. And what was interesting was one of the person that I saw that was testifying in this against this bill, the, the, the person actually stood up and said, oh, we shouldn't be teaching children because they is gonna, they're going to be rebellious to the parents. They're going to make the parents in trouble. Okay, let's, let's not let the victim know that they are being abused because they make rebellious against a, the abuser. That's a statement. That's the reason why they're pushing against this bill. Like, this is the kind of things that's going on, you guys. And, and this is the kind of things that we are dealing with, fighting for victims of parental alienation. Is there's people going out there that say this is not real. It shouldn't be an esoteric thing. It should be a lot more widespread and acknowledged. There's nothing secret about this. This is child abuse. It's very widespread. It has very serious impact. We started to talk about what's going on with Kim, the suffering that Kim was going on. You know, I've talked a lot about what's going on with me. This is very similar to Kim's story. You've got short-term impact. You've got long-term impact. You know, children suffering from all sorts of things. Jacob started to talk about it. Jacob, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how do you think and how do you see this has impacted you? How, what is the impact on your life? Um, how else do you think would have been different if you weren't being subjected to this? Oh, man. It's, it's something I think about a lot. Um, I know even now in my current relationship, you know, it's like, okay, so at what point do we move from, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend to more? Um, what is the, what, what, what makes it right to do that? Uh, when, when is the right time, you know, and I can, I can go back and I've been doing it. It's weird. You know, you go back to the Bible and start looking for an answer. It's not there. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, a feeling you get. And I wonder, you know, it'd be nice if I could reach out to somebody and ask for a little advice on this. So I, I do have some supports, uh, but they're not connected to the family, right? I got to go elsewhere for that. Um, to say, you know, how, how it's changed. That's really the biggest thing is, is I guess believing family was everything. And then seeing that it's not, they're human beings, um, with a history, with a past, um, uh, personally, I, I'll try to make it quick, but I got to with, I did re reconcile a little bit with my mother, but it's almost like I relived the life I did as an adult with my dad's kind of situation, you know, I, I moved in with mom, got to know her again, did some reconciliation, uh, but then got out of my own and got into drinking, partying, that whole lifestyle again, and basically left her and and kind of left her on the hook. It's like, Jake, like, what are you doing with your life kind of thing? And I, I went down a path for a couple of years where I, I was lost 100% as a person, um, you know, uh, you know, drugs, drinking, girls, DJing, all that stuff. Uh, it was a lot of fun, a lot of connections, but that's, you know, the, my 22, 23, 24, 25 years. Uh, maybe even 26 to the point where I reached a breaking point. And I remember breaking down crying one time after, you know, getting a milkshake with a friend and I sat there in the car, it's raining out, I'm bawling. And I look at her and I'm like, am I in love with you? Like, I don't know what this feeling is. What is, what is this? I don't know. She's like, no, you barely know me. That's not love. I'm like, okay, well, what is, what am I so overwhelmed about? You know, I reach out to my mom because, you know, she was always there what is this? And she's like, Jake, you know, have you been doing the drugs drinking again? I said, yeah. She's like, you need, you need to get clean. You got to take care of yourself again. And, you know, at the time I'm like, okay, I'm going to do that. And, you know, get back into it. Uh, three or four or five months later, put myself into another situation where I'm, I'm in trouble. I reach out to mom again. And at this time, I think it's, it's the end of the rope. Okay. This is done. Um, I end up running away basically from my place. Cause I'm so paranoid because of the acquaintances or people that I've brought into my life at this point, I was so unhealthy, um, you know, 170 pounds. Now I'm, geez, I don't know, 250, <laughs> but I was 170 pounds then. And 
uh, calling my mom saying, I don't know what to do. And she shows up and helps me run away from my house. And uh, at 26 years old, uh, we move out. I uh, move back into mom's place and I'm still, you know, not all right up in the head. Um, I end up calling the police to try and report some activities that I knew that were going on and they showed up and arrested me under a form 10. Basically I'm an endangerment to myself and I got admitted to a hospital and uh, I remember refusing needles. No, I don't want that. You know, you can't take my blood. And I'm not, then once I get there, I don't want my mom. And then once they get the needles out, Oh, I need my mom. And, and it was just so like weird, but I'm like, I'm really just a child and I am not progressing as a human being. I, I felt, felt like maybe I was stuck. Um, and that was where the change began to happen was because I basically reached a breaking point. Thankfully, you know, I didn't overdose, um, which I'm sure my mom was always scared of happening, um, but couldn't reach through to me. Um, stayed in the hospital for four weeks, uh, got released there, you know, okay, you're doing well. Um, signed up to go to rehab and went to rehab for uh, four weeks. And I remember halfway through trying to quit. And they said, no, you don't want to quit. Like, this is something that's good for you. You're changing already. And they gave me a book called The Celestine Prophecies, which changed my life. Uh, understanding that life can just more than just, you know, a Bible. It's more about energies and people being around you and their experiences and where they're at today. And uh, I, even at that point, I was still so reliant on my mother for help. Uh, somebody else gave me a book that was there called Codependency No More. And I remember reading that and being like, oh, wow. Um this is me. How did this happen? And my mom is actually a human being who is not, you know, someone that I'm attached to in a godlike figure. She's just a woman who has lived a life that I don't know or understand. Um, but at the same time, I don't need to latch onto her for everything. And I had a counselor there that said, you know what, if you feel uncomfortable when your mother's coming to see you, you can say no. I was like, I can't do that. It's my mom. You know, the Bible says this, I can't say no to my mom. And like, no, just, just try it. And I, I really believe that it may have hurt her in that moment, but it was for the better hundred percent for me. I remember saying, no, mom, not today. I don't need your help. And I remember getting out of rehab and seeing, I have nowhere to live. I'm homeless. I have nothing, no money. And I started from zero, uh, got on to government supports. They found me a sober living home and I basically restarted my life. Um, I, I, I still, you know, kept to myself, didn't really tell any of my friends what was going on. I didn't really have anybody to tell. And it was just, you know, between me and, and I'd say my higher power at that point, because I began to learn what that meant rather than calling it God. Um, higher power just felt better, you know, something that I was accountable to and something that I, I wanted to improve with. And then, yeah, two or three years later, living in a sober home, got back in touch with the family, you know, started going to a family brunch and just kind of kept myself and slowly started to you know, rebuild a life um, to see, you know, that's the big thing that would have been different. You know, I look at my girlfriend, she's 27 years old. She's been working for five years, has two condos. And I'm like, I could have been doing that. But at the same time, I wouldn't be here today, you know, without these things happening. So it's it, in my place. I'm, I'm thankful to be grateful for all of this and, you know, things like this that happening. I don't know if that's a little long-winded, but no, that's yeah, incredible. That's where I'm at. Yeah, that it's, it's a miracle story, a hundred percent. And I know that not everybody's story is like that, and it's not possible for everybody. But the biggest thing was my mom was always an option, no matter what. Uh, yeah, she reached out. Sometimes I thought a little bit too much, but at the same time, I never really felt judged. It was just, you know, I'm here for you when you need me. But at the same time, there are boundaries, and you cannot be doing this and expecting life to be just handed to you. And that was where I, you know, got lost and I needed to get lost to be found. Yeah. It was, it was rough. You know, I think I, I hear Kim's story and I've heard people like this before, you know, that you come from hard times and you just keep going back to it. Cause that's what you understand love to be. And it's, it's so hard to break out of that to the point now where, you know, I don't get involved in business connections or personal connections with people that I have a Ugh, feeling about you know if it's not a f yes then it's a no um sorry you know you haven't convinced me of it or you know uh and then I, people are like oh you're so weird with that i'm like well i'm happy i don't mind being weird you know <laughs> yeah thank you so much for sharing I, it takes a lot of courage to share this and that's like you said it's an incredible story my goodness yeah. what you went through so in the chat room courtney says so proud of you jacob uh, and you. Kimmy, Kimmy said, Jacob, you, you're very easily my son in 10 years. 
reach out. I'll be happy to be a part of your support system. Um, Bernard said that if only the alienators would watch this, if they could just understand the devastation they are causing to our children. This definitely, yeah, this is amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And Joanne said, uh, yeah, thank you, Jacob. It's very healing. Um, yeah, and Donna said, you're so strong now. I would love to adopt you. The thing is, Jacob's mother stood by him regardless. She still stood by him, always there for him. He knew that she was there no matter what, even though he abandoned her. She didn't leave. She's just still there no matter what, but still with her, her boundary. She, she didn't let him think that it was okay to to stray off and do the wrong thing so that's that's so important for all the targeted parents out there to know that your children need you no matter what even when your children it seemed like your children abandoned you you still can't walk away you still can't leave you can't give up on your children you have to be there because this is a lifetime thing it's not today it's not a one week it's not a two weeks thing your children need you for life so regardless, if you can't see your children today, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. You look at Kim, she didn't see her, her, her father for um, six years. My mother, yeah, no, for six mother, years. Her mother for six years. And Jacob, you didn't see your mother? It was seven, seven years, yeah. Seven years. Yeah. Seven, it's a long time. It's a long time to not, and should not give up that hope just to believe that you're still going to see your children again. You have to hold on to that because your children really need you. Claudia said, I'm so proud of you. Um, and Anna said, thank you for both of you guys for sharing. Um, Katie said, that's unconditional love, a mother's love. Yeah, that's, that's so important. Um, let me just gather my thought. It, it's such an incredible story. Um, that was amazing. Oh, yes. So I, what I wanted to, to say is that um, what we are just touching here are just few little aspects of how it impacting Kim and Jacob. The reality is the impact is a lot bigger than that, that they themselves may not even see it right now. You know, it's really research have shown that parental alienation caused a whole range of psychological and physical impact on the children. And I mentioned this yesterday a little bit on one of the live video that I did. Um, so they show that children uh, are grown up with identity issue, trust issue, and that's what Jacob touched on. He doesn't even know what love, because we never been taught what love looks like. We don't know what is a good relationship. You don't know how to work things out when you have problem with your relationship. You're putting on your defenses, uh, when you come to good people that come into your life because you're so afraid, you've never seen what is good look like, you don't know how to work things out. Um, and then you also sabotage good things in your life. Um, and you seek familiar, so you seek abusive relationships. So you're stuck in that kind of things. And then uh, children also, uh, these children also grow up with substance abuse. You know, Jacob talking about he, he, He's one of the lucky one. He didn't OD. He actually went through and cleaned himself up. I mean, how many times you see people that end up in the wrong path and never come back? You know, it's so easy. Substance abuse is so serious. Once you get onto that, you know, when it comes to alcohol dependency and substance abuse, the chances of coming back I mean, it's it's really the, that percentage. I, I don't know the stat, but I could bet that it's so low. So for Jacob to be able to come back, and his mother plays a huge role in this. So that's so important for you uh, to not give up on your children out there. Uh, so yeah, so there's all these aspects of psychological abuse. But recently, I also start to do research into other aspects of damage on uh, alienated children. And it turned out that this also have very serious, uh, serious physical uh, impact on the children. So children actually have much higher risk of um, getting cancer, uh, heart diseases, and many other things. Because um, what it did is it caused um, impact. It's, a, it's attack organs. So for example, heart, lungs, and that kind of things um, on the children. And then also, it impacts uh, systems, so the immune system, the response system, things like that, 
Um, and so one of the things that we see is with Kim right now, she has physical, it manifested into a physical illness. Um, so it's not- yeah. my, my disease is neurological. So it's affected in my brains and my receptors and my memory paths are corrupted. And they're still trying to fix all of that because of everything that's happened to me. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I have an autoimmune disease that flare up. Um, and when it does, um, I'm, I'm completely disabled. It's, it's like, it's, it's on and off, but um, um, right now I'm functioning, but there are days that I just did not function. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it caused serious physical impact. And then the other things that Kim has said about, um, and, and I wanna to touch this a little bit, is that um, one of the way that we cope with abuse is we suppress our memory. When you see things that, like things that are bad happen to us, for us to survive, is you shut it down and you don't deal with it. So Kim was saying how she has trouble trying to go back and recall what happened and she didn't even want to go near that, right? It, it impacted you, right? And then Jacob, I have, yeah, I have, I have nightmares, I have flashbacks, I have oh. um, disassociative moments where I'm taken back in time and those scare the hell out of me. That, yes, that I've I definitely have, experienced. It's I've, I've weird. I, it is. Yeah, it's like, it, what am I doing? And, and I actually have panic attacks every night before I go to sleep. Every night before I go to sleep. Still I today? Still today. Yeah. And I'll wake up and have a panic attack. And so it's it's very hard to sleep these days. And my neurologist can't help me. My psychologist can't help me. So I don't know what to do with that. But And I, too, have a substance problem. I, I tried to OD at one point. But I know that I can't do a lot of things. And um I'm actually just fully disabled. I'm actually on disability now because of my disease, because I can't work anymore. So and my disease affects me 24 seven. So some days I can do things and some days I can't. So um, everything you're saying is 100% true. And I, I wish the alienators knew what they were doing and what the outcome would be by their actions. I, I fully wish that. I wish my father could see this. I really do. And I don't wanna do him any harm but I wish he knew, I wish he had any inkling to know the impact that he had. And he knows because his, 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 his children don't speak, so he knows part of it, but I'm sure he blames someone else for that as well. Um, Jacob, I, I know you, you, you jump in and you said, yeah, I, do, you wanna, do you want to add it, a little bit to that? The dreams, the dreams were a thing for me. And I, for me, I, I guess, Growing up pretty Christian, you know, the Bible talks about a lot about dreams and how they're supposed to, you know, can be God speaking to you. And then, you know, as you grow up, you see, well, dreams are just this and this, but I, I, there's still reoccurring dreams that happen. Uh, for me, it's, it's the <laughs> uh, end of the world. You're going up a spiral and you're basically running away from everything. And then you're basically being saved by something. And you don't know what it is or you know it's a zombie apocalypse and it's it's happening again and again and again and you're the one that's kind of just getting out of it um i haven't really talked to a whole lot of people about it i i it's i just overheard you say it and it's i've always wondered i'm like oh man if i could only wake up and write down this dream so i, I started doing that and it seems like the theme is that reoccurring you know needing to be saved or rescued or it's me doing the saving and the rescuing and I've never really, I guess, diving into it or dove into it further to see what more that could do. Maybe that's something I need to, you know, consider doing. I don't really have panic attacks or, or anything like that. I'd say yet, um, you know, maybe the healing that I've given myself has helped with that, but, you know, um, but it's, I, I don't recommend getting them. So. No, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not, I, I've been with girls who are relationships with people who have panic attacks and, and, and I, I, to my ignorance, I, I've been told to basically shut up because I'm sitting there, you know, what's going on? Tell me what you're going through. And they're like, it's not something you can talk about. It's just something you experience. Uh, and even with anxiety, I think before rehab, I, you know, people would say, oh, I have anxiety. I'm like, oh, well, what are you anxious about? You tell me what it is, this thing that, that you, that you're so anxious about. And they're like, no, like you don't get it. Like, that's not, you know, there's things you can be anxious about, you know, that are upcoming in the future, but this is just like an anxiety panic attack. There is no real cause that the person can identify with um, because it's internal or subconscious or, you know, even further. I'm not too sure what all the terms are, but that's 
it's just it, it yeah i I, re, I i feel so much for those people but at the same time i want to know but i i can't it's not something it's, i, it's like I want to it's like your subconscious is kicking your ass it's like saying here <sighs> take this and take that it's mind-blowing yeah it i just is. yeah I feel so much for for you guys you're so strong like to to be able to continue to keep going you know if i were to experience that i'd be drowning myself in anything i could drown myself in you know no. it's I don't think you would. I, I think you would, um, as far as you've come, I think that you would accept it for what it is. You would understand that it's something you have to deal with. You have to survive and you would figure out whatever you need to do to manage that. That's, that's, that's true. What you do. And you don't talk about it a lot. You just kind of deal with it and move yeah. on. So that's, that's what <laughs> I do. So sorry for all the swear words, but that's, no, no, it's okay. I don't to, yeah. I like, I don't complain about it. I don't, what I just, this is it. It's a matter of fact and yeah. I have to deal with it. So yeah. <laughs> The thing is, one of the big aspects of healing is sleep. And for Kim yeah. to have panic attack before going to bed every night and then having nightmares, you're not only suffering from what it is right now, you're, you're not, you're being, not having the ability to heal. Yeah, my doctors are concerned because there are nights I don't sleep, so. And it, it's, it comes and goes, so. It's, it's very, it's, it's awful i don't recommend that either do whatever you can to sleep not the substance thing but yeah wear yourself out so do do holistically whatever you can to sleep but i found a couple of things that help but um i'm still looking for that one thing that works every time and kim has you have you talk about you have gone through a lot of therapy you you've been yes. you've been very proactive in seeking your solution to seeking your Heal, you know, healing. So what happened is um, in 2013, 2014, when I got this disease, I went through all kinds of neurological testing and I went through a, um, so I was forgetting things. I wasn't remembering things. And I thought I had problems with, I was Alzheimer prone already at a younger age. And so they ran tests to see what I remembered, what I didn't remember. And um, because I was in so much pain all the time, and I'm sorry, that is my dog. I apologize for that. Um, so I was having such memory lapses and memory losses and I couldn't grasp words. I couldn't pull them out words. I mean, I'm a straight A student. I, I graduated with high honors even in college. So I, I couldn't grasp words and I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? So they did, they ran all these tests. And what came out of those tests is I got referred to a psychologist who dealt with patients who dealt with chronic PTSD. And he helped me understand how my past, and he's the first one that ever did this, he helped me to come to the, the answers. He didn't tell me what it was that I experienced, but he helped me understand what I experienced. He helped me become more self-aware of what I was experiencing. And, that, and that's been recent. And that has been the healing process. And, I'll, and I can tell you, and I'm sure Jacob has experienced this as well, I have come out of some of those mad as hell because I never realized what my father did and how it impacted everything in my life, especially um, putting myself in dangerous situations. Actually, in 2019, I was helping a friend with their resume. I was helping a friend, you know, it was innocent. This friend raped me. And I knew at that moment I wanted to leave. And I didn't because he convinced me to stay. And then I realized after the fact, that I did recognize those danger signals, but because I lived in terror and trauma and danger as a child, I learned to ignore them. So here, and then I put myself in this position where I was sexually assaulted by a friend when I knew I needed to leave. So that still pisses me off to this day. So I think if, if parents who want to alienate their kids understood Oh my God, this aspect that, oh my God, my daughter could, or my son could put themselves in a position where they could actually be physically hurt or harmed in any way, would, would they stop doing that? And, and that's, and I think that that's one thing that puzzles me is, did he know that this is, was going to be my life? So I don't even trust my instincts now. Is this dangerous or is this not dangerous? I have to, I have to, and I'm not stupid, but I have to consciously think about this. And I'm sure Jacob, you would even encounter that as well. And I'm sure you too have. Et cetera, where you actually have to think about, oh my gosh, am I, am I doing the right thing? Am I making things? And what the outcome? No, you don't think because you want to do the right thing in the moment. So yeah. um, it, it's just, it's horrifying. It's just horrifying. 
Yeah, what what the children suffer is like you mentioned. You have a therapist that understand PTSD. I know in the chat room someone mentioned PTSD. It's what we suffer is um, actually it's beyond PTSD. It's, yeah. it's a complex form of PTSD. Yeah. And 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 like you said, the same with me is you you lose the ability to judge because your response system was on alert the whole time. You know, for yeah. other people, when you get you know. Your response system is meant to help you, alert you when you're in danger, and then when you're in danger, it alert you, and then you respond to that, and then it's good, and then it be back to normal. But when children in this situation, your response system is on alert the whole time, and then eventually it's shut down because your it your whole body is just it's constantly in alert so you lose the ability to judge now what is a red flag what is a danger signal and you can't tell you know what is good and what's bad and yeah i definitely feel the same way it's i'm constantly question questioning my judgment um and it has nothing to do with your level of intellect it has nothing to do with your level of education it's none of those things. It's it's attack your system, your your immune system, your response system, and yeah, it affects all all the aspects of life. Um, I know Joanne mentioned that. Can you both come back uh, so that we can hear more about your experiences? Joanne, do you want to um, clarify specifically what kind of things that you you want Jacob and Kim to talk about? Uh, meanwhile, I'm gonna go on with more of my questions. Um, I, I still have a lot more questions. So let's talk about the reunif. Uh, no, before we talk about reunification, let's talk about uh, back then. You know, like Kim. I mean, Kim mother went to the extent not only she's sending letters, she's sending gifts and and things, but she's even took out an ad on the newspaper to let Kim and her her siblings know that she loved them that she still loved them. So, you know, uh, but it still didn't work. Right. And then the same with Jacob, um, you know, you, you, it didn't work. What what do you think could have worked? What would what would have the targeted parents said or how could they have said it so that you would back then if you go back then, is there any way for you to hear from them and go Oh yeah, my parents still love me. Because for me, I was that child and my father reached out and it didn't matter. It didn't matter, he was a monster. I didn't know why he was a monster, but he was a monster. I was told that he was a monster, so it didn't matter what he said. He was a monster, so I refused that relationship no matter what. Um, so yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot too. Like, what what is the answer, right? If there is one, and it, all I can say is I can only think of my situation, and like my mom did everything she could besides you know, showing up and knocking on the door because, you know, that, that would have been a little bit, maybe breaking some laws or something that, yeah, she reached out as much as she could. Um, I don't even know if there was something inside of me that knew she still loved me or it was more just like, it doesn't matter. Like I've, I've been given enough information about this person, even if she did love me because of all these other things that I know about her, just, I don't, I, not right now. Um, somewhere to say well like anything about the relationships too uh well your mom must love you she's your mother um there's a little part of the story i did leave out and it might add a little more complication to it it's kind of left it out but i was adopted i had a different birth dad um but i was adopted at the age of you know four five six months old um which is another great part of the story but again that's not really about the alienation part um so there was always that you know, well, maybe you were adopted. Maybe your mom is the one that really loves you and your dad's doing this because he's alienating you. But it was a, all the kids were uh, had the same kind of treatment. I, I don't believe I was treated any special or, um, or different because of it. And, you know, we, we all still had our doubts about mom. And I think even to the point where maybe my other brothers and sisters might have taken the flag up a little stronger for dad. I, I, I didn't really take the adoption thing into, into consideration, you know, just because I had a different birth dad. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, you know, I get, she's there. She just, she left us, you know, that, that was the only thing that was the reoccurring, 
I guess, uh, confirmation of it's not that she didn't love me, but maybe that was it, you know, maybe that was the message that was subliminally, subliminally being sent to us that, that, you know, and there's nothing you can do about that. And I guess my little, I'd say little mind, but you know, as a, as a young person, you're still developing. And until you get to that point where you're able to think for yourself. And I think back to what you're saying about the abuse of children, um, silencing someone's inner voice, I believe should be a death penalty. Um, I, I know it's extreme, but if you're able to shut off someone's conscience um, with your information, that's, that's, I don't know, that's got to be the worst crime out there. There, there, there isn't an, any other way. You're, you're basically taking someone's humanity away from them uh, without them even realizing it, uh, especially as a young person. Uh, that's something that needs to be watered and, and given sunlight and, and properly nourished, um, you know, with a community or without a community, however you're going to do it. But yeah, I can't really say that anything my mom could have done differently would make me believe that she still loved me because that that part of, I guess, being able to love her was was cut off or, or shut down or, or put in the corner or in the dark or whatever term you want to use until light was shine on it again. And then, you know, OK, maybe I, I could check that out. You know, maybe I'll go look at that. Um yeah, I, I don't know, you know, maybe short of what is showing up, but, but even like, you know, like you said, putting ads in the paper, like how, how far do you go? You know, do you write your son's name on the side of a mountain and say, mommy loves you? Um, well, yeah, of course, that's what she's going to say, you know, but like that's, that was the reaction to it. It wasn't a thank you. It was a, you know, well, yeah, she has to do that to get us back. Obviously she's trying to win us back. You know, it was like an, it was an ownership thing. And, and yeah, like the kids aren't your, your toys to play with or your, your property to, you know, distribute here and there. It's, it's their lives at stake here. And uh, yeah, people, people don't realize like, like the impact you have, it's a lifetime. It's not just a, you know, 18 years of childhood. It's, it's, you know, children become young adults and young adults become people and they have lives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, I don't know if she could have done anything different. It, it, she did the best she could. And that's, you know, kind of with my realization as, as I grew up to be an adult was she did the best she could. Um, I've even gotten to the point of trying to rationalize for my dad. You know, he did the best he could. But then I'm like, oh, it's because he was raised by an RCMP officer. Or, you know, he didn't have the best schooling or, or something like that. I'm trying to, you know, make excuses for him. And that, that, that doesn't go anywhere. I just let that thought go. And you know, it is what it is. And I'm just happy I'm here today to be able to be here to share this kind of story. Um, but my heart goes out to parents out there that want to know what's what's the answer. Um, I, I don't know. I, I pray for your kids. Love them unconditionally. Um, know that there is a force out there that's stronger than words. It's, it's the love that you're going to have for them regardless. Uh, if they call you or don't call you or respond to you or don't respond to you. Um, there will be a day when someone in their life reminds them of you. And if you have been doing that, they're going to remember that. That's, that's what happens. It's that you can't help it. That's, that's their life. That's, that's what they have to go back on. You know, it's, yeah, I don't know. Well, that, you know I would add to that, that make sure yeah. as a parent that you're getting all the mental health help that you can get as well. Yes. I think that it gets Improve more yourself. It gets yeah. someone who understands what's going on and how best to approach this. So that's, that's what I would say as well. Um, yeah, so this is a very big question, right? For, for targeted parents, this is like the golden ticket, like the million dollar question is, you know, what can I do so that my children, you know, still loves me and knows that I love them. Um, and this is, this is really big question. And there's no one right answer. There's no, um, this is a experimental development thing. Uh, and, you know, for Kim, her mother took out an ad in the newspaper. For Jacob, his mother did an YouTube video that reminded him of all the memories. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of this, right? One is that the children's being locked down in this psychological um, sort of prison. The, if you still have an alienator there that's still brainwashing the children, punishing the children, threatening the children, it's very difficult to expect the children to be free from that. So with that kind of situation, you do have to seek legal support. 
And that's why we have these programs that we interview lawyers and talk to you about different aspects of how you fight this in court. So you sometimes you don't want to, but you do have to seek legal support for that. And then when you come to once the children is released psychologically, now you have the brainwashing that you have to reverse. Um, and so there's a lot of that that need to you need to get the right reunification therapy. But then there's there's other things. There's other, and I, I think about this model all the time is that when you look at this model of how do someone perceive uh, a message right um, like when you hear a message there's this two aspects of it, one is a is a messenger and the other aspect of it is a message it's not just the message itself right it's whether you believe whether how do you think about the messenger. Do you like this person? Do you, do you love this person? Do you believe this person? Do you trust this person? It, it has a lot of impact into the message. But the child right now is looking at you as a, as a monster. The child thinks that you are you're not worth it or that you are dangerous. So that's already not good for you. And then another thing is a motive. If you think, if you get a message from someone and if you think that this person have a motive, you won't listen to the message. So if the child, and like Jacob said, oh, you're just saying it because you, you're obviously just trying to fight to win me back. I'm just a thing for you. So, you know, if you're being questioned as a human being, as your role as a parent, so obviously your message is not going to be effective. Then on top of that, you're being questioned for your motive. Right, so then two of that you is double whamming, you know, because the child doesn't trust your motive, so it doesn't work. And then now you look at the message itself, right? You know, like what what's the format is being said, and then what is the actual message? So that's another aspect of it. So when I think of this model, like as a targeted parent, like I mentioned, um, your role is not good. You know, you're already being undermined in the children's mind. And then your motive is being questioned. So that's why the role of other people is so important. If you could have a different messenger, now that could be a therapist, it could be a school teacher, it could be um, your children's friends, it could be the extended family. So think about it. If you could have somebody that the children trust and listen to, and then somebody that the children doesn't question their motive, then obviously in that model, you already have that aspect improve a lot so think about it um so that's why when we work in this we're not just we're talking to you guys we we try to we try to help you but we're also working out there we're working with a professional out there like therapists and school teachers we're working on programs right now trying to change the school system and like i just said you know claudia and us we we're trying to change the the law to make the school education because we want the messenger to be not just the targeted parent we need somebody else to speak up yeah. for us we need the public to change the, their perspective so the public can speak up for us so that you know that need to change um and, and so that that's just one aspect of it the other aspect of it i wanted to mention is that the children have been brainwashed and one aspect of brainwashing is that their memory has been erased and been replaced, you know, their history has been rewritten. And so one of the things that was so effective in Jacob's mother's video is that she trying to bring back and remind him of his history by showing all these photos. She did a slideshow of the photos of his childhood. And when you look at a picture, it's not just a picture. Because when you look at a picture, it brings back of what happened that day, how you felt, who else was there, and then it brings up a lot of different things, right? And so that's so important is to bring. So Jacob, you, you guys, so in the chat room, Jacob just posted a video, um, the link to the YouTube video that we are talking about, which is the video that his mother did for him. And thank you so much, Jacob, and really appreciate you for sharing this. Uh, so yeah, parents, if you guys want to check that out later, um, Please do. I'm, I haven't seen it myself, but yeah. So that is so important is to help your your children um, to revive their memories. And so, if you guys haven't listened to it, we did an interview of Dr. Um, Stanley Claywa. He has a lot of experience when it comes to clinical um, psychology and um, reunification techniques. And that's one of the aspects that you talk about is to try to make sure you trying to remind the children of the memories and 
don't just let the you know when there's something that is false don't just stand by it feel comfortable to correct it um, but yeah so that's a very important aspect of it too um okay so let's talk about um we talk about the impact on you guys we talk about the alienating behaviors we talk about um uh what could be done let's talk about reunification so kim what made you reunify with your mother so back to the suitcase on the curb and my dad telling me i had to go find someone else to live um for a time i stayed it was just a few months before the end of the school year it was um i think it was my freshman year in high school and I stayed with a girlfriend who actually was there when he dropped my suitcase off. So she invited me, she and her family invited me to stay with them for a few months. And then at the end of the time, I flew back to Wisconsin to see my mom. Um, when I, I had a lot of things on the plane, so I was the last person off the plane. So um, my brother was already back home or back by my mom. So as I got the plane, my brother was standing there. And these were times before you had to go through um, TSA and all those other things. This, this is the 80s people. <laughs> so um, my brother's standing there and I said, well, where's mom? And he said, every time someone got off the plane, she stepped further back down the corridor. So she was halfway out the door. She didn't think I was coming back. She was, um, when I walked up to there, her, um, she actually was standing there crying. She just couldn't believe that I was finally coming home. So she had two of us. She was just waiting for the other third. So, and um, took me home to, you know, where I grew up as a, as a child. And, um, you know, she tried to make everything normal, but it, we didn't have any sort of counseling. I mean, we just, she just kind of jumped back into what she was doing and we were left to do whatever. So it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't great. I mean, we never really talked about what happened. She never really wanted to hear anything or try to help us in any way. Like I said, her mental health was, had already been, I mean, she tried, but she, she didn't have that help. She didn't have, she hadn't gone and healed herself. She hadn't gone for the help that she probably should have gone for. And we didn't go for any help at any point in time. No one ever recognized that we were so severely harmed that we needed help. I mean, we were doing things that and at 16 year old, I was in the bar. I mean, I was drinking already at 16. Granted the drinking age was 18, but I was still in the bar. I was doing all kinds of fun things. So um, yeah, we definitely needed help back then, but no one ever recognized that. So that was, that, that was the extent of it. I mean, we got to see family and people we hadn't seen in years, but um, some wanted to hear and some didn't. Some we were comfortable talking about it too and some weren't, but I think my, um, that always was, why didn't you help my mom come and get me? Except for the one person who helped her. There was no family helped her. No one ever helped her try to come get us. No one, no one. Her mom and dad, her brothers, her brother, her sisters, no one ever tried to help her come get us. And I never, and I still never will understand why they didn't help her more. And she was so distraught that um, I don't think that they were there for her. And I think that that was their family dynamic. But um, my my family just didn't believe in counseling or that anyone else could help. We just had to push it down and move move on. But obviously that didn't, you know, that wasn't successful. So I'm hope I'm I'm happy to hear that there is actually a plan in place. You know, some to do's, you know, some not to do, some guidance on how to re, um, reunite with your children. I think that that is so important, and I think. One thing to add, and I hope someone is put this somewhere, but always stay positive. Always stay positive when speaking with your alienated children. Because as you know, I have the same experience and that was so important to get, you know, the kids back. So, so important. So, um, with Kim, the trigger for the reunification is actually the alienators abandon her. Um, that's the beginning of the trigger for her to reunite with her mother. Um, and so um, we actually done research on this, and it, it's actually um, not shockingly uncommon. It's actually pretty common. It's actually one of the big aspects of uh, reunification is 
very often, and you don't realize it, on the surface, it seems like, you know, alienators and the children seem happy and all that. But really, because the alienators are abusive by nature, so that relationship uh, between the alienator and the targeted children are usually not sustainable. And because of their abusive nature, at some point, it's likely that the alienators will turn against the children themselves. And that's usually a very good trigger for the children to start to think about you, the targeted parents, and the children start to wonder what's going on. Did they suffer the same thing that I am suffering and that kind of thing. And that makes the children to start to wake up to the abuse. Um, so with Kim, the oh, I, and, and I can tell you that I was very nervous to make that contact with my mom. I didn't know if she'd want me anymore. I didn't know if I'd be accepted. I didn't know if she would be at the same phone number. I didn't know any of that. So even you know seeing her for the first time that was it was very anxiety driven it was very it was i'm sure it was for her i mean she was upset obviously she was happy with i was there but she was very probably just just the same um nervous and anxious but i was i didn't know what i was going to do when i you know my suitcase was left where was i going to go and obviously my first thought was well, i've got to try my mom and then if not then um you know i'll see what i can do and Honestly, I didn't stay with her long. I've been living on my own since I was 17. So that didn't last long. I've been on my own since then. So it didn't, yeah, that didn't last long. But um, yeah, I'll never forget the day getting off the plane and having and seeing her there. But there's a lot of anxiety with being re reunited and, and making that first contact because the parent could have changed their mind. Like, how, do you, how dare they abandon me and, and not be accepting to, to welcome them back into their life? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go a bit more into the reunification in a second. Um, and I really appreciate what you just said, Kim. Um, um, but yeah, just go back to the trigger. One of it is that the alienators abandon the child. With you, Jacob, you mentioned a few things. You mentioned that um, other people start to make you think about your mother. They start to question, you know, maybe you should re-examine that. You should look at you know, why did you abandon your mother? Maybe she's not bad as you think, right? So, so other people saying things that make you think about it. Uh, and also you yourself went through uh, a breaking point in your life, right? You were going through this trauma in your life. And, and so do you wanna add anything else to the trigger aspect of reunification? What caused you to reunite with your mother? Yeah, and I mean, I'll definitely, I see some of the comments saying, you know, all my messages are going through and they're blocked. And like, uh, as, a, as a young adult, I can't really say I was a child, but as a teenager, mom sending me text after text, I, it almost felt like she got to a point where she knew that like, you know, no matter what she said, I wasn't listening. And I wouldn't say that she gave up, but I would say that she, 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 she made the message clear, no matter what, I'm here for you. And that was kind of just, that was, that was the end of it. Um, there wasn't that consistent, Hey, what are you doing? You know, you know, or happy birthday, you know, there'd be a happy birthday message, but it wasn't a constant every couple of weeks checking in on you. What are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. And, and I think that space really did allow me to, I guess, develop as a person. And then, yeah, those outside people that are, that are asking that that was all natural, right? My mom didn't have anybody, um, you know, can you go talk to my son and, and ask him if he misses his mom? Uh, because I would have sniffed that out. I would have been like, oh yeah, I know you, you're friends with my mom. You're trying to, you know, make me go back to her. And and I would have just shut it out. Um, but what really, what really what it was was, you know, that that breakdown of understanding I I needed a mother or I needed some support. And you know, you, you I guess I'm kind of grateful for the way I was brought up because it was kind of secluded. I, I didn't have outside influences. Um, but at the same time, there were people, you know, in the church that I knew, and I'd call them, you know, mom here and then, and it wasn't really that big of a deal. I didn't think anything of it. But that point, I feel like they would also say, well, you know, your mom's there too for you. I know you don't feel that way, but she she is there. And, and it's almost having like that head up and, and maybe being there for people who you hear are alienated from someone, you know, it's just that reminder. Well, you know, I know you, you, you think that way, but you know, deep down they did, you know, that is your parent. And and I've had uh, heard other extreme stories too, where there are some, you know, very horrible mothers out there that, that don't care for their children. And it, it makes me very sad to hear that. But 
for us that you know that are working against this it's 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 there 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 is hope for the kids and and it you don't know how it's going to come um it might be through a movie it might be through a tv show it could be through uh, nowadays why we have tiktok instagram little clip that's going to remind them of their mom you know and and it's 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 hard to trust that it'll happen and it might not happen right away um it it it, it takes time our brains develop at what one one minute one second at a time we can't rush things and when they're rushed it's like you're saying about the messenger or the message right things get lost uh because we feel like we're being forced into something um i know something for me that, that really stood out and I, you mentioned it like kind of before is our reaction to things and for me when i went to rehab i learned that you know there's the flight or uh fight response and i wasn't either i was the freeze and uh, they're like oh, well, we need to work on something else. I'm like, yeah, because I'm not running from it. I'm not fighting it. They're like, what are you doing? I'm, like, I'm just stuck in it. What am I supposed to do? Like, I'm trying to do the right thing and I don't know what the right thing is. So to help me, what do I, what do, I do? And they're like, well, breathe. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, when you, when you leave rehab, this is the only thing I want you to focus on is your breathing. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't get it. They're like, okay, so when you stop breathing and you freeze, you deplete your brain of oxygen. You can, I guess, go into a panic mode and, and really, I was just shutting down. That was my response to things. So when people were reminding me of that, you know, mother's love is always a mother's love. And, you know, she bore you for nine months and had you. And, it, you know, she didn't just forget about you. Um, okay, I'll have a breath and think about this. Wow. Okay. What would it be like if I were to have a kid? Would I do this? And then you really start to think, okay, maybe there is a chance. Um, but then, of course, you hear that, oh, yeah, but she's still this. So, you know, maybe you shut it off. But it's for those very small moments that seed is planted and then it grows. Um, then maybe there's that birthday message. And for once, you know, say, thanks, mom. And like I've seen the pictures and the uh, screenshots of people saying, look, is this, is this, this is amazing. Oh, my God. Um, when she says thanks, that's not necessarily an opening to send a paragraph. It's just send a heart back. Love you always. And that's it. Um, you know, when, when they're ready to open up or reconnect, it, it kind of just happens. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know if there's much really to add. I don't have experience. And I've, I feel like there's some parents out there that, you know, they'll, they'll shut off those ideas. But at the same time, I'm not a parent, so I don't know. And, you know, I can only pray that the day comes where I am a parent. And, you know, I, I experience that. Um, but I, I don't know. Because I, I I don't know what it would take to to trigger a child to remember that you know you're 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 loved. Um, I always wondered, you know, maybe if I saw mom doing something for herself um, and working on herself or something, and I didn't realize that that's what she was doing the entire time. Yeah, she went to seminary school and then went to a, a, a I can't remember what, what all she did, but she 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 really did make herself better as a as a human being. And even to the point, and, and this is something that always was hard for me, was she did get some, um, I don't know how to say it nicely, um, modifications done to her physical appearance uh, for whatever reason. And and at the time, that was also something that we judged her for. Oh, yeah, see this, she doesn't, you know, she's rejecting this and she's no longer a mom because she, now she looks different. And yeah, that was the thought I had when I first saw her. And it took a while for me to accept this is my mom, but it's also a woman who had a history and a, she, she, she also came from a family. She didn't know who her dad was. Uh, she just recently found out who her dad was like literally like three or four months ago. Um, and it's just, a, it's an incredible story uh, to, to think that like I had in my mind that there's a normal or a, a proper way to have a family. And I had to let that idea go just to, 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 to move forward with anything. Um, but yes, yeah, to, 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 to triggers, it's just, you don't know what it could be. You really don't. Um, I just know that if you try too hard, that can push people away. And I'm sure we've all experienced that in relationships, friendships. You know, there's the kid on the street that runs up and down. Hey, you want to be my friend? You want to be my friend? And No, I don't want to be your friend. And then there's the kid that doesn't say anything. Um, you know, you might want to just go sit with him. Hey, you doing okay? You know, it's, it's, it's weird how that works. But every personality is so different. And I'm very thankful for my girlfriend for you know she's really into the astrology side of things and so we, we dug into that and i was like wow so does this mean that like i can classify people as personalities based on their astrology types and she said no it's just a possibility of what happened when they were born but people develop into that and i'm like well yeah I, I probably contradict everything that my signs say and she's like no actually what you're doing is a reflection of that and i'm like oh, i don't believe that i i developed myself on my own and i forget that no there were all all these other forces at work 
um, that wasn't just a parent, uh, you know, mom or dad or second dad or second mom, but they all played their part. Um, yeah. So um, in the chat room, Claudia said, if Jacob's mom is watching, I'm half so happy for you and Jacob. So Jacob's mom is watching. Um, so just so that you guys know, and and yeah. yes, we are very happy for their story. It's amazing. Um, now, so yeah, so we talk about the trigger. Now let's talk about the reunification itself. Now, so Kim already shared with us that she okay. was so nervous. She was so nervous oh, to yeah. up to that reunification. The thing is, parents, you need to, and, and Jacob's also touched a little bit about it, about, you know, like, just because he responded, don't just swamp him with, you know, just overwhelming amount of whatever it is, like dumping emotional stuff on the children. So yeah, for parents, um, a lot of parents think, oh, reunification, that's, you know, like, that's, you know, happily ever after kind of ending. No, no, that's just the beginning, right? You have to think about the children, think about, um, oh, and, and Carla's your mom, Jacob, is that right? There you go, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that, <laughs> you might have heard of her. <laughs> so Jacob's mom is in the chat room. She said, hello. Oh, my heart is full. Carla, yeah. thank you so much. So anyway, so yeah, so you need when it comes to reunification, if it does ever come up, if it if you have that opportunity as a parent of the parents, you have to think of all these things that actually Kim and Jacob have mentioned a lot of that. Um, one is that your children because they have rejected you all along it's very difficult for them to just be able to just come back comfortably it's been awkward right so if you make it any more difficult for them you are blocking this path of reunification and like kim talk about how nervous she is you have to make it easy for your children to, you know, this this is not punishment time for your children. It's, it's not at all. They You have to remember, they've been victims. And now coming back, it takes a lot of courage for them to even say hello to you. So you have to, and you're the parents. You can't put this on the children. It's your job. You're the parents. Always. It doesn't matter what age. You're the parents. So you have to open that path for children. You have to be there and open your arms wide and open for your children. So that's a big part of it. Um, the other thing that both Kim and can I add? Can I add to that? So I think one of the things parents always, not always, but can project on the kids is how they were feeling and how everything made them feel. They need to put that, they need to put that somewhere else. They need to work on that, their own healing somewhere else. This needs to be about the kid. You need to understand, you need to ask the child, ask the child and I wish someone had asked this. How are you doing? What can I do to help you? Anything, anything to think about to make me feel like I was important as a kid. And I, I had something that I needed to deal with because everyone dismissing it made me think like, oh, I'm crazy to even think that I have something going on that happened to me that I need to heal from. But everyone always made it about, my mom did this a lot. She made it about herself and how it made her feel. So I felt like I couldn't bring up anything about me because it was always about her. So I would encourage parents who are going through this, heal yourself in whatever way you can with whatever professional you can. But when, it, when you do get reunited with your child, do not bring that up and make any contact with your child positive and about them. Don't bring up your stuff. Don't put that in it. Like you said, it's, not, it's about the child. It's not about you. Push that aside. So I just wanted to add that that's as, as a, an alien, a targeted and an, a, a a child who has been alienated, whatever. Um, I just think that that's really important to say from both sides, from both of you. So thank you. Thank you. Jacob, I know you wanted to uh, add something. Go ahead. It's, I, I don't even know. It's it's 100% that, like what she said there, it's it's dead on. Um, um, I mean, I had to experience it myself. And I, I, I think I learned it in rehab, really. And I'm very thankful that, you know, living a country in Canada here and, and we have these programs that are available to us and understanding that you need to be a whole person before you can really, you know, connect with someone uh, again or, or in a healthy way or else that, that codependency kind of comes on. And, and, and we don't really think of it in, in, in a parenting aspect, I don't think, but it, that's, that's really what, what it can be. And 
I, I'd say, I don't, I don't know if the term is letting go of your children because it's absolutely, I'm not a parent. I, I have no right to say that, but I feel like once I felt like I was let go of, then I could return. And I, I don't know if that, that makes sense, it, but, but it, it kind of does. It's that aspect of, you know, if you let the bird go and it comes back, it loves you kind of thing. And it's really hard to, 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 to take in and, I don't expect everybody to, to really do it that way, but that was kind of what's resonated with me. Um, you know, she's there for me when I want to come home. I'm, I can, I can do that. And I remember sitting there with her and, and she had these little things and thankfully she did do the work because when we did talk to each other again, after it, she had these little steps that we would do. And I'll never forget uh, the one uh, activity we tried was you take two chairs, you sit them next to each other. Now, this is after, of course, we've acknowledged each other and, you know, sorry, apologies were made. But we took two chairs and we sat them facing each other, no table, and hands on hands on your knees. And you just try to make eye contact. It was left eye to left eye, I think. Um, and I couldn't. I, I, it, I would burst out laughing. And I remember thinking to myself, what am I, some sadist or sadistic person that I can't just maintain eye contact with my mother? And I remember her just being forgiving and opening and being like, look, no, this just this this happens. This is because of all the cobwebs that you've got in your brain and they need to be kind of taken off. And we'll just sit here and say nothing. Like, that's it. Let's just try to make eye contact. And I, I, I don't know how long it took before we were able to do that. But it was that that aspect of, you know, she's willing to do that um and it wasn't like a no it has to be this way we need to reconnect on this on this method and yeah just being open to you know whatever works um rather than trying to fit it into what worked for her um she also had you know i guess the tools to do it um so you know props to her for for having that um yeah so Something that both Kim and Jacob have mentioned, and the two perfect example here, is that with Kim's situation, her mother um, let herself go. She she gave up. She didn't she didn't continue to live her life. She let the trauma destroy her life. So her mother was full of wounded trauma. So when Kim came back to her mother, her mother was not available emotionally for Kim. So they couldn't heal that relationship. But with Jacob, his mother have gone on and tried to, to heal herself. She learned the tools, she lived her life, she tried to improve herself. She, she's, so when he came back to her, she was available and they was able to heal that relationship. And this is so important. You have to be lovable. If you want your children to come back and love you, you have to be lovable. And you cannot be lovable if you are broken. So you have to live your full life. You have to be your best self. And especially with your children, and you can't dump all that emotional stuff on your children. I saw a question in the chat room. I think Tina, Tina said that, how do you, how do you, be loving with the constant disrespect so this is very important and i see this a lot with parents is that um i apologize you guys um one second um I'm sorry, I have my children in the house. Uh, so anyway, um, yes. So you okay? So the question about how do you that? How do you do that? How you be emotionally available and loving and open arms to your children after so much of disrespect? Uh, it's very important the perspective that you have on your children. You have to look at your children with compassion. You have to recognize that they are victims. You cannot blame victims for what happened. So the same, like just imagine if let's say somebody is sick and they cough, do you punish them for coughing? You don't because they're sick, they have to cough, right? So the same with children, they are victim. The behavior that they are, uh, that you saw in them is not who they are. It's not, you can't blame them for what happened. So just like Kim said, you have to find your healing somewhere else so that when it comes to your children, you, your your role is the parent. You have to be parents regardless. You cannot 
put this on your children. It's not your children's job. It's your job as a parent. So this is really important. Um, um, so yeah, so the aspect of reunification is that coming back, having the opportunity to, to reunite is not enough. You yourself have to be have been continuing trying to figure out how to heal, how to be whole, how to be open. And then you have to have the tools like, you know, Jacob talked about that exercise. Kim mentioned about how they never look uh, get therapy. Yeah, getting therapy is very important. Getting help to rebuild that relationship is very important. Um, I think we um, I we cover a lot, and I know we run way longer than we plan. Uh, I wanted to see um, is there anything else critical that we should add? Uh, both of Kim and Jacob, do you guys want to? I think I just put this out there and it's more or less like, you know, we did reconnect and I might have been what 20, oh, I, I don't know, 21, 22, 23, somewhere around there. Um, but as you heard, right, my story progressed. I even, you know, after reconnecting, I still had my issues. You know, I wasn't a perfect son by any means. And I still was learning. Um, we had, we had some issues. I think we, even now we might still have issues, but I've gotten to the point now as a, as a, adult there are some things you know you can focus on and really drag out and destroy and just there's no point like there are some things that are worth the battle and there are some things that aren't um you know whether or not um they said thank you for a christmas card you know whether or not they remembered your birthday i, I like that for me those killed me you know why didn't i get that and at the same time if i didn't let that go that holding on to that would would just consume me and i'd then the hate would come back and, and it was like, what the heck? I, I, you know, come on, I got to move on. And I've taken that into other aspects of my life as well. So if anything, it's, you know, those, those things that are super big to you really, really ask, are, are they as big as they, they should be or could be, you have a, someone's life here. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's, you know, too far. I know there's lots of all these little things that happen in between people um, that, that we think are a big deal to us. Maybe it's a matter of, hey, you know, does this matter to you? Is this, is this that big of a deal? You know, do you, do you enjoy your birthdays? You know, maybe maybe there's a question that needs to be asked. Maybe there's a conversation that needs to be had before the, you know, how could you forget about me or, you know, that kind of message. And, and yeah, the messenger can get shot by the message. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a tough situation. And I feel like there is no one answer for any of this. Every situation is different. Every human learns differently. Every person hears differently. Um, rehab again changed my life for teaching me how to listen. You know, active listening is something I don't think we know about as human beings. It's not taught in schools how to actively listen. Like, what does that mean? I can't actively listen. That's how I talk. <laughs> uh, no, it's to actually hear what's being said and maybe repeat it back to yourself in your own voice and and then think about you know what does it mean coming from where they're coming from. But also, are these words their own? Right? We don't know. Um, I feel like everything we are as people is. We're based on our experiences and what we've been exposed to. And if we've only been exposed to alienators, then the language that's going to come out of our mouths is going to be pretty harsh. Um, you know, we got to get out and be around people who aren't alienators, I think, before we change. And, and as people or as children going up out of it, maybe your kids haven't been through, you know, enough loving situations to be open to, you know, bigger love, I guess, if that, that's the way it is. Um, yeah, I guess pretty much it. I'd add to it. And thank you again for this. Yeah. So what I would add is that if um, as a targeted parent, you're hurt and you're thinking about how you're feeling and like, like Jacob said, you're upset because your child isn't acknowledging you or you're not doing something you're expecting of them. I think that as a targeted parent, you need to let all that go. You need to imagine your child is in a position where they're fighting to just appease the parent that is being the alienator. And they're just trying to, to get their love to, um, cause some alienators don't love their children unconditionally. I don't, I don't believe that in any way, shape or form. I think that they use their children as a form of control or, or something else. I, 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 I don't believe that they always love their children in, um, unconditionally. But the children that live with um, a parent who is the alienator put their children through so much and they punish those children if they don't agree with them. 
or if they do something for the targeted parent that they don't agree with. They punish their children. So I think the targeted parent a lot of times won't take that into account. So a child is only doing anything and everything they can to appease that parent, not get into trouble. And honestly, they're just trying to survive. And I think that if more targeted parents understood that, they would be more gentle and more kind and try to be more empathetic with their child, knowing the turmoil in their head that's going on and, and how that's going to affect them for years and years to come and not keep trying to use their child as a tug of, as a rope in a tug of war. A child is not a rope in a tug of war. And, and the more love and positivity they can bring to that child at any moment in time, um, I think is the best scenario for that child to survive and understand that that targeted parent is the most loving parent for them. And, and I can tell you this because of my court battle and other things as targeted child, that there's things you can do to let them know that they might, my, my daughters know that. So, and I think that the more targeted parents that understand that, I think that's a really key piece to all of it. I really do. So that's what I wanted to add to all this. So I wish that more people understood that and, and got rid of whatever's in their head and how they're feeling and just put that crap aside. That's for another day in time. Do not put that on your kids ever. Thank because you that's so going to hurt them more. It's going to help them. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much. Because really that is so important for parents and and we don't want to undermine your experience at all targeted parents really like we know what you're going through what you are going through is horrific it's so traumatic you're losing your children you're being put down you're being dragged through the mud you're being dragged through court you're losing your life you're losing your everything um so what you're going through is very traumatic and then your children um with rejecting you, disrespectful, turning you down, uh, spying on you, create false allegations on you. Like, I understand it's very traumatic. And I even remember seeing someone in the chat room saying how they feel like they are all up against the whole world, like they're all alone. Um, and, and I know what you're going through. And it's, and, and that's the thing. That's why we are here, because we want you to know that you're not alone what you are experiencing millions of other parents are going through as well that doesn't make it right it's it's horrible and that's why we're trying to find a solution uh, but you you need that support you definitely need that but that support shouldn't be coming from your children your children imagine the kind of things that your children are going through is a lot worse than what you are going through so have that compassion for your children and whatever it is you have to be then available as a loving safe and available parent to your children those are the three things that that uh, dr amy becker talk about we interview her multiple times you can check in our videos and you'll find that uh, but yes that's a very important aspect of that um there's a there's a recommendation a question in the chat room that i thought was amazing i'm going to put jacob and carla on the spot and I wanted to ask, could we come back and have Carla and Jacob in a session with mother and son and do this interview again? Because uh, I think that I th was that Paul or someone, I really appreciate that suggestion. That's an, a brilliant idea. Um, you don't have to answer right now, but if we could have you guys come back and have this um, you know, parent and child experience and have a session of just two of you guys, that would be amazing. Um, so anyway, you know, take your time, think about it. Thank uh, you. And yeah. And, and yeah, we would love to have two of you guys come back and, and do that. Yeah. Um, got one thing I'd throw on that, keep in mind, I'm just the oldest, right? She's also, I also have, I say she, because I also feel a little alienated from my little brothers and sisters because of all of this, you know, these circumstances. I have three little brothers and three little sisters that I try to reach out to on their birthdays. And I'm like, why don't I get responses? And I have to think, well, what did mom do for me? Okay, let them know I'm there. And that's all I can do. Uh, you know, like their posts on Facebook, thankfully some friends with some of them uh, follow some of their accounts, but at the same time, you know, mom's battle is definitely not over. And, you know, it's it's tough. I look at me now, if I'm going to start a family, I, I'm going to learn from her and uh, yeah, take what I can from it. So yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk on that and see if we could. Well, Carla said yes. <laughs> I know. I can see I, it. <laughs> I see that. Carla said yes. Yeah. Yes. 
So, yeah. so we're waiting for Jacob. You guys. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we're looking out. We might be coming back with both Carla and Jacob, both mom and and son, to talk about this. And yes, it's very complex situation. And and you know, when you have multiple children, children are being affected differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because of their ages, but also their role in that sort of hierarchy of the family dynamic. So. Anyway, but thank you so much. Really grateful, you guys, for both of you, for your for your strength to be where you are today, for you to cope with and to get to where you are today, but also so much for your strength to share this story and for your generosity to, to share it with so many parents out there. And parents, thank you so much for being here, for your support always. Um, if you could support us in Patreon, we are on Patreon. Really um, appreciate your support there. It's Victim to Hero on Patreon uh, platform. Um, and really, thank you for being here. Please like the video. Please share. Let more people know. We need to change the public awareness. More people need to know about this. More people need to see that this is a public health crisis. This needs to change because it impacts not just you two as individual, it impacts society. There's a huge society cost because of this. And then it affecting all this different, because this is like the root of the tree, you know, it's your sibling, your extended family, your friends, it's impacting the whole society. And this problem is so serious and so widespread, it needs to be changed. So thank you everyone for being here and have an amazing weekend. I'm gonna come back soon. Um, uh, with more events soon. So uh, if you are not already a part of our mailing list, please join the mailing list on victimtohero.com website. Uh, my name again is Petra Dito and thank you, you guys. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we are offline, just, okay. um, just us. Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate it, you guys. And I'm sorry it went so long. Um, um, so I'm totally okay I'm with it, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to follow up with you guys.